Okay. Yep. I think. Okay. Let's go ahead and admit our visitors. Whoever is watching on YouTube is already live. So Nancy, can you admit our visitors? Yes, our visitors are here with us. Okay. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Wolf and here with the San Jose Astronomical Association. And this is a streaming Solar Sunday. We're here to spend some time uh, with uh, solar astronomy today. So welcome everybody. And uh, yeah, so this is the first streaming Solar Sunday of 2021. We did a few of these last week after COVID forced us all to stay at home. And uh, this is now the first time we're doing this this year. We're finally in a position where the sky is clear enough and the sun is in a good position where I can see it from the backyard so I can point the telescope to it and then share the views with you. So uh, yeah, let, let's see how today goes. Um, and uh, another first today is that we're doing this on Zoom. So this is something we did not do last year, but today we're having uh, you know, a meeting here on Zoom with all of you who are joining us from, from Meetup. Uh, so welcome. And uh, we're also streaming this to YouTube as well for folks you know, who might wanna just sit back and watch it you know, through that channel. Um, but uh, you know, I'm hoping that our Zoom experience today will work well and we're looking to learn from this and uh, maybe you can help us later with some feedback so we can, we can do better. Um, the old format for today is uh, that we're doing this in two parts. We're starting now with kind of the basics session. This is talking about sunspots, prominences, filaments, and some more, you know, sciencey stuff about the sun. So this session is intended for folks who are new to solar astronomy or who just love this part so much that they want to watch it again. Um, but if you've seen this before, right, uh, and you're just interested in what the latest views of the sun are today and maybe some new topics of the month, um, that section is starting at around 245. So we've got this broken into these two pieces, you know, for folks who are new to solar astronomy and then folks who may just want to see what's new this month. All right. Um, and yeah, like I said a moment ago, so we're going to be relying on you to give us feedback on how we are doing, you know, throughout this, this meeting together and also at the end so we can learn from it and uh, you know, try to do better in the future. Um, so if, if you are watching on YouTube, uh, if you're on Zoom, don't worry about this, but if you're on YouTube, here's just a quick hint for you. You can turn YouTube to what we call the dark theme. Um, and you know, since we're dealing here with astronomy, we're talking about outer space, outer space is dark. And so some of the images that we'll be sharing look better when you are going to dark theme in YouTube. And you can do this by um, you know, clicking on your little you know, icon, your avatar icon at the top right. If you pull that down, there is this dark theme option. If you click there, um, then you get another dialog box where there's a little slider here. And if you switch that, then you are in dark theme and your background will change from you know, white to, to gray, dark gray. So it's entirely optional, but you may wanna check this out if you're on YouTube. It may make the experience uh, for these astronomy sessions a little bit nicer. The overall format for today, or at least for this first section, will be that we'll go through an introduction. We'll talk about viewing the sun safely. We'll look at the sun's place in our solar system and you know how we can look at the sun in different types of light. We'll specifically talk about something we call H-alpha astronomy. We'll talk about the internal structure of the sun a little bit. We'll look at some pretty cool sites, you know, different ways the sun presents itself. And we'll talk about the solar cycle. And throughout all of this, we'll make some visits to my backyard where we'll see some live views of the sun. And we'll also have some Q&A sessions built into this whole thing so we can interact there. Um, and let me quickly introduce the hosts for today. So we have uh, Nancy. So Nancy, you can say hi. Nancy is one person who is going to help moderate our chat and just kind of manage the, the Zoom, Zoom session. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first Solar Sunday in 2021. Thanks, Nancy. And then we also have Lipika, um, who will be giving a short presentation during the second part of the show today. And she's also going to help us manage some of the aspects of the Zoom meeting today. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Lipika. And then we have uh, Sheena, 
um, who is uh, an SJA member, a San Jose Astronomical Association member from Seattle, believe it or not. And Chino is here today, who is also going to help us manage the Zoom session and the Zoom chat and some of the Q&A. Hi, everyone. Glad to be here. Thanks, Chino. And then we have Ananya, um, who is uh, in the San Jose area, and she's here to help me with some of the content for the first part, you know, the, the basics portion of today's presentation. Say hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, and then finally, uh, last but not least, we have Bill, who's kind of a special guest. Uh, Bill was in San Jose and part of the SJA and actually the solar program leader before I picked this up. And now uh, Bill is also in Seattle, but he's joining us today. Uh, to talk about solar eclipses during the second half of today's session. Bill, you want to say hi? Uh-oh. Okay. All right. Yeah. Bill, we'll say hi later. There he is. Hi, okay. <laughs> Good to check in from Seattle. Uh, Miss the guys from uh, San Jose and all the good clean air they have down there. Seattle's a little tough, so <laughs> we're doing the best yeah. we can. Uh, so San Jose is still a better place for astronomy, right? I'm, although I'm glad sure to Seattle be with you. All right, offer. thanks. Yep. <clears throat> okay, and then of course, yeah, you're stuck with me, so I'm Wolf, um, as I mentioned at the beginning. And then we may have a special guest, depending on what he decides to do. So this is Zipper the cat. Um, you know, I'm his staff, and you know, he lets me share this house, so he may pop into the meeting at some point. We'll we'll see. Uh, let's do a quick introduction of you guys here on Zoom. So unfortunately, we can't have each of you right now just just you know say your names. That probably would take a little bit too long. But we'd like to do a quickie poll to get a feel for who's on the line with us today, uh, because that helps us understand um, you know our audience and, and also what you might be looking for. And uh, Lipika is going to help launch this for us. So Lipika is going to start a short poll, but maybe you can answer a few questions and just introduce yourself, so we can get a feel for who's on the line with us today. So Lipika, I think you popped it up, right? Yeah, I launched the poll, so there should be about six questions. So you're gonna have to scroll and make sure you answer as many as you can. And then, um, yeah, just submit after you're done. Yeah, and this should be easy one. So don't worry, this is not a test. You can't fail this, you know, just, just give it a shot. It just, it just helps us get a feel. So how are we doing? Are we getting some responses coming in? Yeah, we've gotten one so far, so we're just gonna wait like maybe a couple minutes. Okay. So you know, maybe we should next time, uh, you know, offer people to mail them a candy bar or something if they actually click the the poll buttons here. So. But yeah, I mean, one thing we are hoping to do is, you know, we uh, last year, like I said, we, we did these sessions all on YouTube. We did not have the Zoom environment. We are hoping that Zoom today will allow us to be a lot more interactive um, because we can engage, you know, with, with you who are joining us here today more real time, you know, through chat and then later also, you know, through some interactive voice conversation. And so, yeah, so this poll is just to kind of give us a start here in terms of this interactivity. I'm hoping that later this year, you know, we can go back to being in Hokey Park even um i think we all miss that right you know that there's something to be said for being able to meet in person there and you know look through the telescopes together and just have you know one-on-one -on -one conversations there or small group chats but we'll do the best we can here you know on zoom instead today so how are we doing the majority of people have answered so i am going to end the poll so for those okay. of you who want to get your responses in make sure you do that now three two okay I am going to share the results. Okay. All right. Looks like we have, um, yeah, a bunch of folks who've actually been to SJA events before. Okay. So cool. Thanks for coming back. Um, and, uh, uh, all right. We've got, you know, I guess just a little more than half of you are paid SJA members. Thanks. I appreciate that. You don't have to be, you know, these public events are open to everybody, whether you're a paid SJA member or not, but we appreciate if you are. And uh, let's see, first Solar Sunday event. Yes, all right. Hey, welcome to Solar Sundays. You know, so um, as you'll see over the next hour, you know, solar astronomy has some unique stuff to offer. It's a little different from the nighttime sessions that, that maybe you attended to before. Attended before. And uh, okay, almost everybody is from the South Bay. Nobody is from elsewhere in the universe. That's kind of disappointing, actually. But I guess maybe to be expected. And let's see, most of you have seen a total eclipse. Ah, oh, and only one of you has not. Okay, and those the one of you. Who has not you know you should get ready for 2024 and uh, bill will talk about that a little bit during the second part of the session 
And uh, let's see, we have a couple of you who are uh, very familiar with solar astronomy. That's great. So maybe you can even help us, you know, get through the session. If the questions that come up, you know, maybe you can even help us answer those. Cool. Thank you. All right. So let me, let me move on here. Um, so in Zoom, uh, if you want to interact with us in Zoom, uh, you know, please ask questions in one of two ways. You can raise your hand, and we'll show you in a moment how, how you can do that if you're not familiar, but there's a mechanism for this. Uh, and if you do raise your hand in Zoom, then someone will uh, call on you a little bit later, right, where we can have some interaction. Or you can just contribute questions or comments you know, through the chat channel in Zoom. Uh, please do stay muted unless you, know, you have something to say and we call upon you. Uh, otherwise, it can get a little chaotic in these uh, large Zoom meetings otherwise. And in any case, we'll have some opportunity later for open discussions as time permits. Uh, if, if you are new to Zoom and you haven't done this raise your hand thing before, uh, if you are calling in from a web browser, then you should have the status bar at the bottom, this, this little control bar. There's the reactions item that you can click on. And if you do that, then a little pop-up should allow you to raise your hand. And if you, you know, click that again, then you can also lower your hand. So this is this interaction mechanism you can try out. If you're on a phone, it, may look like this, right? So here would be your phone screen. There's the more button on the bottom right. If you click that, then again, there is a raise your hand option here. I realize that some of your devices may be different, but I'm hoping this gives you an idea for how to do this if, if this is something that's new to you. Now, if you're on YouTube, uh, please ask questions there via chat. We will pay attention to that as well. And we'll address questions um, that you ask there during the question breaks that we have built into this presentation. And uh, we'll also have some questions for you along the way where you can help us participate. Mm -hmm. All right, before we dive into the details, uh, just a quick uh, introduction of the San Jose Astronomical Association. You know, we're an educational organization in San Jose, California. We're a nonprofit. And we have a whole bunch of public programs, uh, public star parties, nighttime and daytime like this one. We have school star parties, public science talks that we have been doing online during COVID days. Uh, we have you know, equipment help uh, in a loaner program, and we have swap meets normally. And, uh, and if you do choose to be a paid member, there are some benefits there, you know, like imaging workshops, uh, there's some beginner training, uh, the loaner program that I mentioned a moment ago, we have a library and we have some private observing sessions. And paid membership is not so bad, it's like 20 bucks a year, you know, price of a large pizza or maybe even a little bit less. So it can be worth it. Now, of course, COVID has made a lot of things more difficult for all of us such that we have not been able to hold our uh, you know, in-person events. Instead, we've been trying to do online what we can, but maybe sometime later this year, we can be back to doing events in the park. And I'm certainly looking forward to that. If you're looking for, for uh, more information, you can check sga.net, which is our website. All right. Now, if we were doing this in person, you know, we would be in Hoagie Park, which is kind of uh, SJA's base camp. Uh, and there, you know, it would look something like this. So here's a couple of pictures from prior solar Sundays where we are set up on the sidewalk next to these tennis courts. And you can see our solar scopes here and, you know, folks visiting. And on a given solar Sunday, we'll have usually a few dozen people come through, you know, talk to us and look at the scopes and enjoy the views of the sun. So I wish we could do that today, but we can do a quick, uh, um, you know, instead of, I'm sorry, whoops. That was an accidental click. If we were in, in, in Hoagie Park, we would actually be seeing uh, something like this, right? So here, this is a virtual visit to Hoagie Park through a program called Stellarium, which is an astronomy program that you can actually download for yourself if you like. And so here is that sidewalk where we'd be set up. You know, over here are the tennis courts. And, uh, you know, if we look up there, hey, there's the sun. That's what we'd be looking at with our telescopes if we were here. Now, we're not there. But the software allows us to do one cool thing that we can't do in real life. And if I click down here, I can actually turn off the atmosphere. And so this is the daytime view if the uh, our atmosphere, you know, our, our air wouldn't glow blue, right? And then we could actually see, you know, still here's the sun and you can see all the stars that are out in the daytime, but they're just obscured by the atmospheric glow. So this is kind of cool. You know, this is the one thing that gives us a uh, where, where the virtual world has a benefit over the physical world because we can turn off the atmosphere and, for example, see the constellation of Orion here, which is uh, visible in the nighttime sky in the winter, but in the daytime, I'm sorry, in the summer sky is out in the daytime and so therefore obscured by the bright light from the sun. So, yeah. Okay, so instead of having telescopes in the... Uh, 
Hoagie Park sidewalk will instead, you know, deal with the ones that I have in my backyard. So, so here, right, this is a telescope that is that I have set up this morning in my backyard, and it is currently tracking the sun. And in a little bit, we'll we'll look through that. So this is just kind of the preview of the equipment that we have, and uh, you know, this telescope is ready for us to to take a view through uh, in, a, in a little bit. Uh, but before we do that, so uh, just a note of caution here, right? So you've probably heard this, maybe your mom told you this when you were a kid, right? Do not look at the sun without proper eye protection. So if we have, you know, a telescope like this, this is one type of telescope that we use for nighttime observation where, you know, there's a big opening um, right here where the light would enter and then you would look through the telescope here in the back. This is great for nighttime, but at daytime, do not ever use this kind of a setup to look at the sun. You will uh, hurt your eyes severely and possibly go blind. So what we have to do to make this kind of stuff safe is apply solar filters. So here is that same telescope with a filter applied that blocks out most of the sunlight such that the telescope becomes safe to use during the day to look at the sun. Here's the same kind of thing. Um, and yeah, you know, this filter might look a little flimsy as it's just mylar film in some cases. It can also be a plate of glass depending on the filter. But even this flimsy mylar film is actually made specifically to um, protect us from the sun and it does block out all the dangerous light. Here's the same kind of thing for binoculars. So if you want to look at the sun through binoculars, you can do that with the proper filtering. And then here on the right side are uh, sunglasses, right, that we use during solar eclipses, for example, right? So you can put these right on your face and with that, you can look straight at the sun safely. Just like uh, all these folks are doing here, you know? So everybody here is probably looking at the solar eclipse with their solar glasses, except this one girl who's very smart because she doesn't have her glasses on. She's not looking up and she's not looking at the sun. So. Please, uh, whenever you go out there and you look at the sun, always use proper protection for your eyes and your equipment. Even if you use a camera or something, you know, don't damage your camera sensors either. All these things, your eyes, those sensors need proper sun protection, proper filters. Okay, with that out of the way, you know, here's a nice uh, rendering of our solar system, you know, with the sun in the center and here are the planets, there's Mercury. Venus, here's the Earth with our moon, and then there's Mars. And there's lots of exciting action on Mars these days with a, a Perseverance rover, for example, and China just landed a probe and a rover there as well. Uh, and then we have, of course, the outer planets with Jupiter, Saturn, and so on. And here's the asteroid belt. So this is a really pretty uh, rendering of our solar system. But in a couple of important ways, this is actually a really bad picture. It's really wrong in the sense that the scale is all off, right? So this is not at all correct in terms of sizing and spacing of the objects out in space. And so this picture is much more accurate. And yeah, I realize you probably can't even see all that much here, right? So there's like a tiny sliver on the left and that is a piece of the sun. And most of the sun is actually off screen here, right? So the sun is actually a giant ball that's off to the side, a little bit off screen. And then you can see some faint dots right here. You know, maybe three faint dots. Mercury is so tiny, you can't even see it. And the three dots that you do see are Venus, Earth, and Mars. So you can see that they're actually bunched up pretty close together and relatively close to the sun, but they're tiny compared to the sun. Then there is the asteroid belt, and then you have Jupiter, Saturn, and the outer more planets, and they're actually spread apart quite far. So on the scale of the solar system, right, the rocky planets, Earth, and our immediate neighbors, yeah, they're actually really close together, relatively close to the sun, relatively close to, <clears throat> relatively close to each other, and then things get spread out quite far. So it's good to keep that in mind. The, you know, space is really big, and often our experience here on Earth doesn't quite prepare us for the, the distances, the sizes of things that are out there in space. Okay, so... Let's go start looking at the sun. But, uh, and to do that, let's ask a question. How do we really see anything, right? Well, we see things through light, right? So right now I'm sitting in front of my computer monitor and I'm seeing, of course, images here because the screen emits light and my eyes receive that light and can interpret it. If I look out the window, I see things because sunlight is bouncing off trees and houses, right? And again, I can see that. Um, but light is actually complex, right? So if we think about that, you've even experienced some of this complexity, right? And it can be quite beautiful. So here are a couple of pictures of rainbows that I've taken in the past. And I'm sure you've seen this as well, right? And rainbows reveal some of the complexity of the white light that we usually think about because rainbows split white light into, you know, pretty colors like this, right? Um, and so to understand that a little bit better, uh, Ananya is actually gonna talk to us about the uh, spectrum. Thanks, Will. 
So the same thing happens with the prism like you see on this slide. The white light from the sun goes through the prism and splits into the rainbow. So on the next slide, you'll see the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's made up of different types of radiation. And radiation may seem like a scary word, but really it's just different types of light. The light you saw on the rainbow is called visible light. And it's called this because our eyes can detect it unlike other types of radiation. And as you can see, visible light is only a small part of this entire spectrum. We have built many instruments and machines to detect other types of radiation. On the right side of the scale, you'll see long radio waves and AM and FM radio waves, which are all part of radio waves. If you have a radio in your house or in your car, they use radio waves. And they can also be used by things like remote control toys. So radio waves and other types of radiation are really just different types of light, but our eyes can only see the visible range. There are many different types of insects and other animals that can see outside the visible range. So next to the radio waves are microwaves, which are used by your microwaves and are also used by things like your phone and Wi-Fi routers. And the next group is infrared waves, or IR, which is given off by a hot object. You can feel infrared light as heat. So when you put your hand up to something hot, such as like a lamp or even the sun, the warmth you feel is coming to you in infrared waves. Next is visible light, which is the stuff we can see. And then there's UV, which stands for ultraviolet light, and it can cause sunburns. And then there's x-rays, like x-rays at the doctor's office, and they pass through most substances. And on the very left are gamma rays, which carry a large amount of energy and are really dangerous. These rays usually come from outer space, but they're not very frequent. Our atmosphere usually helps block out these rays so you don't have to deal with them. And that's the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So using these different types of radiation, you can view the sun in many different ways. This is also one of the reasons that you shouldn't look at the sun directly, because if you stare at the sun for too long, the ultraviolet light will flood your retina and it will literally burn the exposed tissue, which can cause blindness. Back to you, Wolf. Oh, thanks. That was great. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, all this stuff that you see here, the electromagnetic spectrum, they're all just different times of light, like Ananya said, right? And the visible part is just a tiny fraction of it, right? So there's so much stuff here that our our bodily senses cannot perceive, but we've learned to perceive these things through instruments and we've learned to leverage them with our technology, like the radio that Ananya talked about. So yeah. So now if we uh, if we take this and uh, file that away for, for use in a moment, Let's talk about the sun here, right? So here are some different views of the sun on this poster that we usually have out in Hoagie Park as kind of a discussion aid. I know there's a lot going on on this poster with lots of tiny print. Don't worry about reading it. We'll just kind of step through it and I'll, I'll talk to it. So, so this view here is labeled the photosphere. So this is a kind of a yellowish thing here, but the sun really glows primarily in, in kind of white light, just like we, we tend to see it outside. But again, don't, don't go looking directly at it, right? Um, but in, in this view, in the photosphere, which is essentially the surface of the sun, insofar as the, the sun has a surface, um, you know, we can sometimes see structures called sunspots, and there are you know, some examples of this here, and we'll talk about sunspots more later. Okay, so the photosphere is essentially the surface of the sun, and it's what we see, you know, when we just perceive the white light of the sun, and yeah, and it's the home to sunspots sometimes. Then we have a layer of the sun called the chromosphere. The chromosphere is kind of the atmosphere of the sun. So it's like one layer out from the photosphere. And here uh, we find structures called prominences and filaments in what we call the H alpha view of the chromosphere. And we'll explain all this stuff a little bit more in a second. And then if we again step out a little bit more, we get to a place in the sun called the inner corona. This is something that's visible in UV light. So again, with our eyes, we would never be able to see this type of image, but we can detect it through instruments. Uh, and and uh, like Ananya mentioned, right, our atmosphere protects us from gamma rays and x-rays and some of the UV rays also actually. So to be able to see this type of image, we actually have to rely on instruments that are out in space. And then finally, here we have the outer corona. And this is a structure of the sun that extends hugely far away from it. And it's this kind of uh, basically, uh, yeah, particles that are being blown away from the sun that are energized, right? And you can see them glowing here uh, in this kind of beautiful structure. And this is something you can see super well during a solar eclipse. I imagine Bill will talk about that some when we get to the solar eclipse part. So we kind of have these four different ways we can look at the sun. 
relatively easily, but actually they're even more than that, right? So we're not going to spend too much time on this slide except to say, look, you know, there are all these different views and these are all different types of light that we can perceive through instruments from the sun. And each one of these types of light gives us different types of information, right? So scientists use different detectors, different types of light to see different parts of the sun and learn different things about it. And we use that you know, kind of approach actually in lots of aspects of science, not just about looking at the sun. Okay. Now, a question that often comes up is like, you know, how hot is the sun? You know, how hot is it up there really? And so, so this part here, the photosphere, we measure at about 6,000 degrees uh, Celsius, which is about 11,000 Fahrenheit. That's pretty hot, so don't, don't go there, right? Now, something weird now happens, right? So I said that the next layer, the chromosphere, is actually a little bit farther out from the sun. So you might think, hey, that's probably cooler, but actually it's about 10,000 degrees C here in the chromosphere. If we go to the inner corona, we're hitting a million degrees C. And then the outer corona, actually maybe I should have had the arrow point more towards this, this part around the disk of the sun, is about 2 million degrees C. So this is very counterintuitive. And there's actually a cool story here because temperature and heat are not really the same thing, right? So uh, I don't want to get too much into that right now. If you're curious about it, hey, you can pop a question into the chat and we can, we can cover this a little bit more later. But, you know, at least these numbers answer the common question of how hot is the sun with the asterisk and the footnote that, hey, temperature and heat are not quite the same thing when we talk about the sun as we usually think, you know, in our everyday experience. All right, let's take a quick break here. Let's see, are there any questions that have collected uh, either in Zoom or on YouTube? Don't see any here in Zoom yet. Okay. I don't know, Nancy, Boy. if you've seen anything in, in YouTube, but nothing in Zoom, it's pretty quiet. <laughs> you know what, it's a quiet Sunday. I think we're gonna inject some question into, into our viewers. If I don't see okay. any questions coming from them, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think so too, right? Boy, if, if uh, you know, it can't be that easy, right? <laughs> so, uh, so let's do this, right? So we we have a uh, we can throw another quick um, you know Zoom poll at you then if you don't have any questions for us. It's kind of a brain cell warm up, right? So we want to make sure your brain is all working. Um, so, uh, Lipika, do you want to you want to turn that on for our audience? Yeah, so we've got two questions for you here, right? How old is the sun? and how many stars are in our Milky Way galaxy. And of course, our sun is one of those stars, right? So our sun is one star of the many stars that are out there in space in the Milky Way galaxy. And come on guys, don't worry about answering this wrong. You know, we, we won't, we won't uh, come knocking on your door later. Don't worry. How's it going, Lipika? It's good. We still have responses coming in. Okay. All right. And again, don't worry about getting it wrong. We just want to make sure you guys are awake. That's all. Okay. So how's it looking? Let's like wait maybe another 30 seconds. So make sure you guys click submit after you're done answering. <laughs> okay. That's important. You got to click that final button. And so, you know, if also if, if you came to the session today, you know, with some certain questions in mind, right, even if it's something that we're not talking about as part of this introductory part, if you came here wondering about, you know, this thing or the other thing about the sun, um, yeah, throw that into the chat, right? So you, you can give us those questions and we'll, we'll see if we can answer them as part of the flow of today's talk. All right, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Let's see. What do we got, uh, Deepika? What's the what's the conclusion? Yep, I just shared the results. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we have the uh, age of the sun at about four point six billion years. That sounds pretty good to me, right? So it is about you know four and a half billion years is the age of our solar system and the Earth and this this whole thing that we're a part of here. Um, and then in terms of the number of stars in the Milky Way, yeah, it's about one to 400 billion, depending on where you look, you know, 200 billion, 400 billion, it's a lot. It's in the hundreds of billions. 
Uh, and there's actually a neighboring galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, that we talk about during some of our nighttime sessions, where you know we have an even larger grouping of stars in that galaxy. Right? So, so yeah, cool stuff. Thanks. Well, we do have a question that just came in from uh, Marie oh, great. in San okay. Jose. Um, so she asked, what have we learned about the sun via the Hubble and other telescopes in space that we did not know previously? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if I have a specific answer on the Hubble, actually. So I'm not aware that we've used the Hubble to observe the sun because uh, the sun is, is really bright and powerful, like we were just talking about on some of the prior slides, right? And so the Hubble was used largely to observe, um, you know, other objects in space, distant galaxies, or even some planets within our own solar system. But I don't think we ever used the Hubble to observe the sun because I think the sun would actually destroy the Hubble if, if we pointed it there. But we have sent other probes to specifically look at the sun. And uh, maybe we can hold on to that question a little bit because as we go through, I think, the material f uh, over the next uh, few minutes, we'll see a couple things that we have learned through other types of telescopes that we have looking at the sun. So, uh, so I hope you. that's a partial answer, at least for now. And, uh, and please ask again if I'm not covering that sufficiently as we go through the material. So I do have a okay. question here posed yes. by a our listener here, Sebastian, mm -hmm. asking, do we know why the chromosphere is so much hotter than the photosphere? Uh, That's a okay. good question. Uh, I'm going to post that. Yeah. 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 Okay. And I guess that kind of goes back to this, this whole um, point of, you know, what, what are heat and... Here we go. Yeah. You know, when I said kind of temperature and heat are not really the same thing, right? Um, and so let me let me give a short answer at least of what what that means. And in fact, you've kind of experienced this probably yourself. I don't know if you've ever put something in your oven, like you've baked the cake, or I don't know, you made yourself a pizza or something. And let's say you turn your oven up to four hundred degrees, whatever, right? And you know you put something in there. You know you don't want to touch the metal parts of the oven, right? Because if you do that, you're going to instantly burn your hand probably pretty badly. But the air, right, inside the oven, it's uncomfortably warm but you're not burning your hand, right? So what's going on there, right? Because all those things are, let's say 400 degrees, if that's what you dialed your oven to, right? So the, the metal you know, casing of the oven is at 400 degrees and so is the air, but somehow the air is not actually burning your hand. And so uh, temperature or, or heat rather, right? It's, it's really, I'm sorry, temperature is really a measure of, of how uh, quickly the uh, elemental particles right in in material are jiggling right you are made up out of atoms everything we know is made up up out of atoms you know tiny tiny particles that constitute our reality and all mass that we all matter that we know of and so they, they jiggle right they move around and uh it's uh, and temperature is a measure of how fast they're moving, right? So if a particular atom is moving slowly, it has a low temperature. If it's moving very quickly, its temperature is high. Now, so you could be hit by an atom that's moving at, let's say, a million degrees, but there's only one of them. You're not really going to feel it. It's a tiny thing that's going to hit you really, really fast, but your body's big. You're not really going to notice, right? But if you get hit by lots of them, then you're going to start noticing, right? So, so temperature is a measure of how fast the individual particles are going and heat is like a measure of the total energy there is right so if there are lots of particles that are hitting you then you know then you're feeling a lot of heat because you're being hit a lot and there's a lot of energy in all those collective collisions that your body is feeling from the particles around you i hope that's kind of making sense a little bit so what's happening in the sun then is that you know the photosphere is is a relatively it's not really a, a, a gaseous thing it, it's um um it's relatively firm, let's say. It's not a solid, right? But so here we have particles dense pretty packed, uh, pretty tightly. And so this is the part that's at 6,000 uh, 6, degrees. As we go up into the chromosphere, things become much more wispy. It's like I said, it's the atmosphere of the sun. So there we have much fewer particles, um, but, uh, but as energy is pumped into that thin atmosphere, actually each particular particle may actually start going pretty fast. Uh, so total energy in the chromosphere would be less. Uh, but each individual particle is going much faster and is therefore hotter. And that kind of keeps going as we go out into the outer layers of the sun. So the outer corona is actually very thin and wispy, but an individual particle here is going to be zooming along at an incredible speed. And that's what gives it the 2 million degrees uh, centigrade. I hope that made sense a little bit. Thank you. That's, that's a very thorough answer, Wolf. Thanks so much. You know what? I feel I've just gained a few points on my astronomy IQ score. 
<laughs> well, thank you. So, yeah, so I don't have any more questions on YouTube here. Uh, do we have any more questions on our Zoom? Um, I think there is one. OK. Um, uh, here's one coming from Maria. Uh, Sheena, Hi, Maria. would you like to go? That, I uh, think uh, that's the one we had already covered. OK. Oh, was that the Hubble Telescope one? Yeah. Okay, okay yeah, right. so we got that. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Since we got okay. good questions, uh, how about we pick up on uh, the wheel, game wheel, the next round? Yeah, sounds good. Uh, Very I... good. Okay. All right, yeah, so time for those questions. That's good. Um, and if, if my answer wasn't clear or something, yeah, then hang on to that, right? And we'll have a little bit of chance later, I think, to just revisit this if, if uh, things don't become clear as we go through this material. Okay. You know what? If it, if it wasn't the only answer, I'm going to put uh, Bill on the spot the next time. Ah, good idea. I like it. <laughs> Make him fix it. <laughs> that's right. OK, back to you. Wolf. All right. So here we see the sun, right? So that's really what we're here for, right? We want to talk about the sun. Here is a view of the sun in the sky. Again, like we said earlier, don't never, you know, don't ever look at this directly without proper protection. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, like I mentioned, this view of the sun is essentially a view of the photosphere. So when we see the sun on a day to day basis, what we're perceiving is largely the light emitted by the photosphere. But uh, the interesting stuff for our conversations today is really happening in the chromosphere, which is, you know, this view from our earlier image. And there we have to go back and think about the uh, electromagnetic spectrum that Ananya talked to us about, right? We have to understand what's happening here is we have to think back to this, you know, bit of science. So, for reference, we all know that the moon is made of cheese. Okay, not really. If you want to know the true answer, you can come to the nighttime astronomy sessions, right? Um, but uh, since we're here to talk about the sun, let's ask, what is the sun made of, right? And that will help us understand, you know, the, the light that is coming from it. So, Ananya, do you want to pick this one up? Yeah. So, if the moon's made of cheese, then does that mean the sun's made of something hot like ghost peppers? Well, not really. <laughs> so, what is the sun made out of? So, on the right, you'll see the periodic table of elements. And I'm sure most of you guys have seen this before, whether in, like, high school or elsewhere. And it might look really daunting because there's so many things on it, but really it's just nature's Lego blocks. All the elements are like the building blocks of nature. And the sun is mainly made out of hydrogen, which is the first element on the periodic table. And it's made up of really hot hydrogen too, which makes the hydrogen atoms really energized. And this could uh, result in it um, uh, releasing light or glowing. So if we go back to the rainbow of visible light at the bottom of the next slide and ask, how does hydrogen glow? Well, it turns out it glows in very specific colors. But before we do that, I'll introduce the words uh, nanometer and wavelength. So a nanometer is essentially a billionth of a meter, which is really, really small. And you can think of wavelength as uh, ocean waves. The more closer together the waves are to each other, the more blue the light will seem. And the more farther apart they are, the more red the light will seem. So back to hydrogen. It will glow in the dark purple color you see there at 410 nanometers. Then this dark blue color at 434 nanometers. And then this light blue color at 486 nanometers. And lastly, the red line at 656 nanometers. This red line is really important and it's called the hydrogen alpha line and it is the brightest line in the visible spectral range of hydrogen. So hydrogen emits these four colors in very specific positions in the visible light range. However, outside this range, hydrogen also contributes to different types of radiation. So on the next side, you'll see the spectral lines for different elements. Uh, you'll see helium, oxygen, and carbon over here. So helium has its own pattern of bright lines and so do oxygen and carbon. Each element on the periodic table has its own unique set of spectral lines. We can look out into distant space and figure out what things are made of by looking at the light that we see coming back from them. You can think of the spectral lines like a barcode at a store or even a fingerprint. But today we'll mostly be looking at hydrogen and specifically the hydrogen alpha line that's in red. And that's all I got for hydrogen spectral lines. Wolf, back to you. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, that was great, right? So, so yeah, key takeaway here is hydrogen light. Uh, excuse me, hydrogen 
that is the main constituent of the sun, glows in very specific patterns, you know, kind of like a special barcode just for hydrogen. And still on this slide, you have examples of these barcodes for other elements, other Lego blocks of nature. And so one of the really cool things, like Ananya mentioned also, is that we can look out into space, we can look at the light coming from an object, and by scanning this barcode, essentially, we can tell what stuff is made of. And this is just truly amazing. We can look at things that we'll never be able to visit, never be able to touch, and we still know kind of what it is. And we talk about that kind of stuff more in some of our nighttime sessions. So come join us for those if you're curious. All right. Now, uh, back to hydrogen alpha, right? So, so yes, we've given this red line a special name. Uh, we call it hydrogen alpha because we're very interested in it for the purposes of our solar astronomy here today. And we have special telescopes that look just for that particular uh, color. That's very specific color of red that hydrogen gas emits. And so on the right side here, you see the kinds of telescopes that we use for this. They look sort of like regular nighttime, you know, star observing telescopes, but they do have special equipment built in and they've got this funny looking cylinder sticking out, for example. If you're curious, you can ask more about that later. But the bottom line is that these are special telescopes that are uh, specifically tuned to just see this. They throw away all of the other light and they see just the hydrogen alpha line. And they also come in different sizes. So the one on the prior slide was what we call a 100 millimeter telescope because the opening here was 100 millimeters. This guy here is a smaller version. This is a 50 millimeter scope. And one of the cool things here is that if you are uh, you know, a paid SJA member, you have access to our loaner program and we have a telescope like this in our loaner program. So you could borrow this and do your own hydrogen alpha astronomy in your backyard with uh, this equipment right here. This is a picture of the uh, loaner kit that you could potentially borrow from us. Uh, and here are a couple of telescopes of the same general kind from a different company called Coronado. At the top is what's called a personal solar telescope. This is very portable. The bottom is a little bigger one, but they're the same kind of thing as the one that I showed on the prior slide, just from a different manufacturer. And uh, yeah, very soon SGA will have one of these PSTs, like this thing at the top, also in the loaner program. And here's the kit that uh, I've, I've just prepared and soon it'll be available. So yeah, if you like this stuff, hey, you can actually check these out you know, from the loaner program and do your own backyard solar astronomy if you like. All right, but for today, today specifically, we're using one of these things. So this is what's called a LUNT 100. So it's a 100 millimeter opening here. So it captures the light, does all the special filtering to be safe and look just at the hydrogen alpha line. And then, you know, if we were doing this with optical, just, just visual astronomy, we'd be putting our heads right here to look through the eyepiece and see what's going on. But instead, I have actually a, a camera plugged into this spot. And so that allows us to see a video feed of the sun, you know, here on our computers. Um, and let's see, so earlier we had this picture from that poster that we started out with, right? This was the chromosphere picture that you've seen before. So this is a picture that was, you know, taken, you know, through more complex and time-consuming fashions and, you know, it made its way onto a NASA poster. The image on the bottom, on the other hand, is a quickie picture that I took with hydrogen alpha telescopes just from my backyard. And even here you can see some cool stuff going on, right? This is from 2017, this particular picture. And it doesn't look quite as fancy as this highly processed one, but you know, highly processed and refined, but you can definitely see there's some cool things going on. So yeah, this is the kind of stuff you can see looking through these H alpha telescopes. So let's actually try that, right? So let's go visit my backyard again. Let's see, let's go here. Okay, so we're still seeing the telescope that you saw earlier. So this telescope has been moving all this time tracking the sun. So the mount, you know, the, the thing that the telescope is attached to knows where the sun is supposed to be in the sky and is actually following it. So let's see how well it's done that. Let's switch to the live view. Oh, there we go. So yeah, here, this is a live view through the telescope. It's drifted a little bit, but let's adjust it so that we can see more. Okay, so what I'm doing is with these little controls here, I'm actually adjusting where the telescope is pointing. And, uh, and yeah, actually right here is something interesting to see. So you can see here this, this bright orange thing, right? That's currently half on screen is the sun. It's the entire sun. And you can see that at the top edge here, right? You can see some interesting little features. Now they look kind of tiny, but keep in mind that the sun is actually really big, right? So that earlier slide that we had that showed kind of the scale of the solar system um, yeah, if you think back to that, right, the sun is about 109 times larger than the Earth in terms of diameter, right? So you could take 109 Earths and stack them up to get all the way across the sun. And so even though you have 
this tiny little structure, relatively tiny looking, it's, it's you know, just about big enough to engulf the Earth. And what we're seeing right here is a prominence. Let's see if we can zoom in on this a little bit. Yeah, here you go. So, so this is hydrogen plasma, very, very hot hydrogen gas, essentially, that is erupting from the quote unquote surface of the sun. And it's driven and shaped by very strong magnetic fields. So these structures come and go, and they're constantly kind of changing shapes and you know, growing and shrinking and the like. And so you can see that there's a lot of this kind of stuff going on here. And you can see that there is definitely, you know, texture. You know, this thing is not just flat and uniform, right? There, there is some stuff going on here. Let's kind of sweep around a little bit and see what else we can find. The other thing to notice here is that within the disk of the sun, yeah, actually, so here also, this is a little wispier, but you can see there's kind of something extending out, sticking out this way. You can also see that within the disk of the sun, you know, things are not smooth. You can see some granulation. There's texture here. This is the chromosphere. So we are seeing variations within the, the sun's atmospheric layer. And uh, we can actually play with the controls of the camera a little bit to let's see how that changes things. So I'm changing the exposure of the camera. And uh, yeah, you know, depending on how we set this, you know, we can see different parts of it better or maybe not so well. Let's see. So often if we make the uh, core of the sun pretty bright in the camera settings, then uh, we might have an easier time seeing some of the prominences. Although in this case, we can tell there's something here, but it looks like it's it's too bright. It's overexposed. So let's let's do this. OK, yeah, here we go. OK, so again, here we have these eruptions from, from the sun. It's driven by straw magnetic fields. They look small, but they're really pretty big. Uh, and actually, you also notice these these dark regions here. Right? They look kind of like scratches or, or little scars on the sun. And these things are the same type of structure as this. So here, when they're on the edge like this, we call them prominences. Again, it's hydrogen plasma, hot hydrogen gas driven by magnetic fields erupting from the sun. And the same kind of thing happens here too, but now they're not just, we're not just seeing them on the, from the side, right? We're seeing them more like from the top. And so when there is one of these, these loops or arcs or, or erupting structures here, yeah, they appear like a dark band scratch or like a scar. So, so this thing here and this thing are really the same type of structure as we see here, except on the edge, we call them prominences and within the disk of the sun, we call them filaments. Okay, looks like down here we don't have all that much going on at the moment. Okay, but yeah, you, you can see that, that there is a bunch of texture within the within the chromosphere here, right? So this is real. Now you notice maybe that the the image is actually jiggling, right? It it doesn't seem stable, and this is largely a result of just the atmosphere, right? There there's heat rising from the ground. Um, air is moving in our own atmosphere, and that's causing the telescope image to become distorted and and shimmer. So if the atmosphere were just perfectly still, we'd be able to get a much better view of the sun, but you know, it is what it is. Okay. Yeah, so here that's kind of a actually a little brighter region in the texture of the sun. There's a perpetual sunspot right here, which is uh, actually dirt in my camera, so you can ignore that. Okay, and kind of now we're back to the top here with these prominences. Okay, so having visited here, let's let's go back to our slides and we'll talk a little more about the kind of stuff we've just seen, and then we'll we'll come back and we'll see how the live view develops uh, over time. Okay, actually, before we do that, yeah, we can take a quick break here to see if any new questions have popped up. So, um, Wolf, we did have um, a question that uh, mm -hmm. was answered by Bill and Ananya, okay. um, but it was uh, from Deep Deepu, um, and it was, "What's the composition of the innermost core of the sun?" And ah, okay. So, it was answered by <laughs> by Bill cool. um, and Ananya, but that was a good question because I wondered about that too when I first was trying to learn about um, the sun's makeup and what the sun is. So that was a, a pretty good, that was a really good question. 
It was. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, and actually, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment anyway, but I appreciate uh, that coming up and you guys already answering it first pass. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, on YouTube, I have some not exactly um, technical questions, but uh, um, Nettie was asking, would this video be posted for viewing later? And the answer yes. is yes, we record it. It's being recorded. Mm -hmm. And maybe an hour afterward, Google's going Google's to go through some um, uh, refining, and then it will be posted on the YouTube link. And I did post it on uh, in chat. Correct. Thank you. Okay. So that's what we have. Okay. Very good. Um, I don't know. Should we throw a question out to the audience? What do you think? Yeah, I think that's a good time for a question. Let me switch gear here. Okay. So you see my game wheel. Yeah. Let's see. So I'm going to spin the game wheel. I'm going to pose two questions. I'm going to ask two questions back to back. And uh, I'm going to try to get everybody to help us answer these questions. Okay. Hopefully they're easy. If not, We'll try to figure out the answers. Here we go. First one. What is it? Is it B? It is B category. <laughs> Let me see. OK, I have a good one. So the question is, what particles does the sun produce that are passing through your body right now? Mm, that is a great Let question. Me, That's a fun yeah, one. Let me repeat the question. Uh, what particles does the sun produce that are passing through your body right now? So that's the first question. We're going to post this question on, on, uh, in the chat window, so you'll be able to follow us through this. And I'm going to do one more question, just so that you can have two questions back to back and work in your brain cell a little bit. Here we go. Next one. Let's see. At J. Okay. And it's B and now it's J. Okay, I have one for J category. What is at the center of the Milky Way? Mm, okay, let question. me repeat. What is at the center of the Milky Way? So now let me post questions that I've just asked you on to chat. Okay, cool. All right. Those are two good questions. So so just to be clear, the job here is for you, the audience, to think about that for a moment, right? And you can throw out the answers to those questions in chat. And while you're thinking about that, we're going to take a moment and I'll, I'll run a short video. This gives you some time to think and also gives the rest of us a moment to kind of appreciate again the size and scale of things, right? So here, let me do this. Yeah, so so I like this video, right? This this starts out showing just some familiar objects, right? Just, just planets from our immediate neighborhood. Right, we're starting with our own moon. We see that every month and it's pretty big, but not quite as big as Mercury, right? So Mercury is the planet closest to the sun, a little bigger than the moon. Then we go to Mars. Then there is Venus. Venus is pretty close in size to Earth. Here's our home. And now we get to our gas giants. And yep, you can tell they're definitely giant compared to the Earth. There's Jupiter, the largest object in our solar system other than the sun. And here is the sun. So you can tell that, hey, the sun is pretty big, right? Earth has become so small, you can't even see it down there anymore on the left. But now we're comparing it to other stars in our galaxy, right? And yeah, here's a star called Arcturus. You can see in the summer sky, it's huge. We've almost lost the Earth, uh, our own sun on the bottom left. Here's Rigel, a big star. An even bigger star called the Pistol Star. Here's a red supergiant. And finally here is the largest known star, which is truly enormous, right, compared to anything that we know. If we were to put that where the sun is, like our entire solar system would be pretty much inside it. Um, and so yeah, Earth is a pretty tiny dot compared to this giant star. So I, I just find this video amazing, right? And it really gives us a feel for just, just, yeah, you know, the scale of things in the universe and the kind of stuff we're used to doesn't really prepare us for, for what's out there. So it's fun to think about. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see, did we get any answers? Yeah, we okay. did. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay, you, Nancy? Nancy? 
after you, after you. Okay, so um, it looks like um, we did get an answer from Joe um, on the question, what is at the center of the Milky Way? Um, and he says black holes. Okay. But I don't see an answer to the first question yet. At least okay. I don't see it here in the chat. Um, yeah, yeah, but the but the black hole answer is a good one. So right, uh, and let's see if I remember. I think Sagittarius A star, I think is is what we call our black hole at the center of the Milky Way. So, yeah, so galaxies all seem to have black holes at their cores, right? And black holes sound like dangerous things, right? And they are often in movies perceived uh, presented as something that just sucks everything in, and uh, um, and that's kind of true but also not really you know a fun question to think about and i'll just throw this out as a bonus question actually and if you want we can get to the answer at the end but what if our own sun were to turn into a black hole all of a sudden right now what would happen think about it okay but really we had another question that we should answer instead right so instead of the black hole we had a question of you know what particles are uh going through our bodies right now right that are produced by the okay. sun. okay yeah for that question i have some answers mm -hmm. here so cool. from the YouTube channel, I have um, Rashi. His answer said magic particles. I love that. <laughs> OK, so it must, that makes it must us think that, more. Yes. Exactly. Now we can have a think about it and guess some more from my questions. Um, I also have from Sebastian. The answer is uh, neutrinos. Mm. And Nettie yep. says the same thing. Very okay? good. Yeah. So there are particles called neutrinos, right? Usually when we when we start learning about chemistry and, and you know particle physics in school, we talk about you know protons and electrons and neutrons, and yeah, those are all real things, you know. That that's what stuff is made of. Uh, but it turns out there are more particles in in the universe, right, than just those three flavors, right? And there's a thing called a neutrino that the sun produces, and neutrinos are pretty pretty fun because they are. Uh, they, they interact very rarely with anything. So we are bathed in a neutrino flow all the time. So the sun is emitting neutrinos, blasting them out into space. And for the most part, they just flow through everything, right? So your body is right now a giant sieve for neutrinos and they mostly just go right through. So it's kind of a fun thing to think about. Um, maybe it sounds scary, but don't worry about it. You know, it's all good. We're we're, we're just fine with that. And we, we built detectors for neutrinos actually underground. So, so we have built detectors for neutrinos in very deep places in the earth to, you know, shield those detectors from like anything else that could possibly confuse the detector so that really in the rare event where a neutrino interacts with, with the particle, you know, like what we're made out of with a particle like a proton or something, you know, we just detect that and, and not be disturbed by any other noisy events so yeah neutrinos are fun we could easily have another hour conversation just on those uh, and it's a fun story about how neutrinos were discovered and you know how we figured out you know what the what kind of neutrinos the sun emits but yeah so the short answer is neutrinos it's cool all right let's see so yeah let's talk about the structure of the sun a little bit more this kind of goes back to maybe the question that popped up earlier so here is a kind of a cutaway of the sun you know we really cannot look inside the sun but we understand you know, how the sun works pretty well from our models of physics. And uh, yeah, so at the core of the sun is, well, what we call the core. So that's basically point one here. And this is where there is a, basically the, the nuclear furnace that produces energy for the sun. So in that core, um, hydrogen gas, hydrogen atoms, excuse me, right? Protons essentially are smashed together and they fuse into helium, the kind of stuff that you find in party balloons. And it turns out that fusion operation of taking hydrogen, smashing it together and have, getting them stick together to produce helium releases a lot of energy. And that's the energy that powers the sun. And that is what's happening in the core. So the core is the fusion reactor. That's where the energy is produced. And then the energy needs to get out, right? It needs to get out from the core. And first uh, on its path to get out, it has to pass through what we call the radiation zone. So there, um, yeah, basically the energy is radiated. And this is kind of a fun factor. It can take thousands to a million years for a bit of energy to get through that layer. So a bit of energy here is a photon, right? A photon is essentially a light particle. And so you could have a photon that's produced in the core of the sun and it leaves the core and it, it goes off, you know, through this radiation zone. But very quickly that photon will actually bump into an atom, into let's say a hydrogen atom. And that hydrogen atom will 
absorb that photon and then re-emit it. So the photon will will uh, the, will hit the hydrogen atom and then get re-emitted, but it get re-emitted in some random direction. So it went boink, boink, right? And so every moment the photon hits a hydrogen atom and then comes back out in some random direction. So essentially the energy from the core has to take like this random drunken walk and eventually just by luck, it will make it through the radiation zone, you know, this boundary from two to three. So yeah, so energy photons take thousands to millions of years to get through this radiation zone because they can't just take a straight shot. They end up taking a drunken walk, like a pinball, right? They keep bumping into things and they keep bumping around until they finally just by sheer luck make it through this layer. And then when we get to the third layer, which is called the convection zone, there things are a little bit more like something we can relate to. Imagine you're boiling noodles in a pot, right? And you would have water bubbling up in your pot, right? It gets heated on the bottom where the pot is standing on the stove. And then, yeah, if you look inside your, your noodle pot, you'll see like these pockets of where, where water is bubbling up. That is convection. And actually the outer layer of the sun here, this third layer is doing the same kind of thing. So energy is, is convected from, is convecting from this layer two, right? Up to the, to the uh, photosphere here. You know, through kind of a boiling action. Yeah, and then layer four is the photosphere that we've talked about already. Five is the chromosphere, that's the atmosphere of the sun, and six is the corona. And then, yeah, there are structures called sunspots. We'll talk about those a little bit more in a moment. And uh, granules we'll also visit a little bit more in a future slide here. And prominence, as we've already talked about and actually seen a little bit in our real-time view today, right? So prominence is this loop or arc of, of hydrogen energized hydrogen that's following strong magnetic field lines. Okay, so let's talk about sunspots a little bit more. Unfortunately, we're at a point today where the sun is not really offering us any fun sunspots to look at. They come and go, and we'll talk about that coming and going a little bit more later. Uh, but since we don't have a real-time view of a fun sunspot today, here's a picture from a, you know prior years, and you can see, yeah, you know, here the sun has these clearly giant dark spots. So what's going on here? Uh, and, and these these spots can be enormous. So here is, is a picture of the Earth for comparison. You know, sunspots can be the size of a city, you know, here on Earth or larger than the entire Earth. And, and a sunspot is essentially a region where the boiling, right, the convection uh, has temporarily slowed. And this again happens through strong magnetic fields. So normally energy is constantly boiling up from the inside of the sun, convecting upwards. But sometimes that convection can be suppressed through strong magnetic fields. And because the convection is slowed in that region, you know, uh, that region ends up becoming a little bit cooler. It's still really, really hot, you know, don't go there. But it's cool enough that relative to the rest of it, it, it appears dark. It's actually still quite bright, but it appears dark to us compared to the even brighter parts of the sun, you know, where the convection has not been suppressed. So yeah, so sunspots can be fun to look at. And, you know, sometime in the not too distant future, I hope that the sun will again present us with cool sunspots to look at in, in real time. Here's, you know, even greater close up of, of a sunspot. It's just amazing structure. And so these kind of pictures were not taken with the Hubble because like I said earlier, the Hubble would probably just be destroyed if we pointed it to the sun. But this was taken, you know, through other types of telescopes specifically uh, intended to view the sun. So this is really a, a fantastic image. And here, um, this was actually new science about a year ago, I think, right? So here is a, a picture of, of these granules. Each one of these is essentially a convection zone. So this is analogous to you looking at your noodle pot and seeing that, oh, the water's boiling up here and the water's boiling up here. So each one of these little granules, little compared to, you know, the United States and the rest of the sun. <laughs> so you can see that a little granule is actually maybe, um, you know, a quarter of the US, but it's little compared to the entire size of the sun. So each one of these little granules is a convection zone where heat is, is convecting up from the lower layers of the sun. And in fact, there is, uh, you know, we can, we can look at this in video form and you've actually seen something similar to if you've ever gone to a Japanese restaurant with the miso soup. So here, you know, one, one day I was having some Japanese food and I was looking at my miso soap and going, hey, look, you know, you, you can see the miso kind of welling up from underneath in little pockets, right? And this is essentially convection action, right? This is, you know, heat rising up from the bottom, convecting to the top and creating this, this kind of flow. And so uh, next time we can go out to Japanese restaurants, you know, now that COVID is getting a little bit under control, have a miso soup, look at it, and it looks a lot like the sun. And here's the actual view of the sun of this kind of thing, right? So here you can see um, actually motion within these granules. This is effectively like the miso soup, except it's the sun. I think that's pretty spectacular. 
All right. Okay, so we just did the miso soup in action. So miso soup of the sun we had, right? And now, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit. Actually, the convection zones I just showed you, right, was was this video. So I got ahead of myself a little bit, right? So here, these convection zones were, you know, these uh, little quote unquote little guys doing their thing on the sun. Okay. And again, to put this into, into perspective in terms of scale, so here is the entire sun for reference. Then there's a square here that is the, the picture that you saw on the prior slides. Uh, and then you know, here is a close up of some of these zones, you know, compared to something like Texas. Okay, now these prior views were of the photosphere, right? The part that is the kind of the bright white portion that we see when we just look at the sun on an, every, on an average day. But then the chromosphere was that next outer layer, the atmospheric layer of the sun. And again, these are pictures from prior years. This is from 2015, where the sun was a lot more active than it is today. And you can see that there are much larger structures than the ones that we just saw in our real-time view. So here, these are prominences. This is hydrogen plasma being kind of ejected or erupting from the outer layers of the sun driven by strong magnetic fields. And there's a little dot here that's the Earth for comparison. So pretty, pretty spectacular, I think. And you can see these, like this dark scratch here, scar, right? This is a filament. It's the same type of structure as the prominence just in the disk of the sun coming towards us. Here's a, another picture from 2015. Again, this is really this is really nice and detailed here. And here it's easy to see that the prominence actually turns into a filament, right? So here, this we call a filament because it's in the disk of the sun, but it's a three-dimensional structure that's sticking out, right? And it actually continues on into then what we continue consider a prominence on the edge of the sun. So I really like this picture. Uh, and this was, again, the quickie picture that I flashed earlier. So this was with my own setup, but just a really fast picture without any particular processing. But even here, right, you can see this kind of W shape. So this is a actually really big filament. Right? And you can, you can kind of make out that this is a three-dimensional structure extending away from, you know, the, the ball of the sun. And, of course, there's also a nice prominence here. Okay, so let's take another quick look at the backyard, I guess, and see now that we've uh, looked at those pictures of past years. Let's compare that again with what the sun is presenting us today. Uh oh. Hey guys, this is live TV. It seems like my connection to my backyard computer has stuck. Okay, let me see if I can reset that quickly. Okay. How about this? Okay, here we go. Okay, yeah. So now we can see again what's happening today compared to these pictures. Now, you know, the images we see here are not nearly as sharp and crisp because this is a real-time view. And like I said earlier, the atmosphere, for example, just heat rising from the ground on the earth, right, is disturbing the image. So that's making it a little blurrier and fuzzier. Right? And, um, and then the sun is just not as active today as it's been in some of those pictures from prior years. But you can still see these nice, you know, prominences here. And actually, it looks like this structure is, is one thing. Um, often... Like I mentioned, these things form loops or arcs. So I think it's starting here, looping and arcing over, and it's terminating here. So I think this whole thing is one, one loop, for example. Let's see, didn't we have something here on the side? How did this develop? Okay, yeah, we've got a little guy. Yeah, we have a little bit over here, but it's not that pronounced. Here's also a really faint, uh, faint guy. Yeah, 
Yeah, you know, uh, last week it turned out there was actually more going on. It does what it does. The sun has weather just like we have weather here on Earth. You know, some days the weather is quite spectacular and, and forceful. Other days it's pretty calm and quiet. And so today the sun is actually more quiet than it was uh, last week. This so Wolf, since you said that today yes. is somewhat quiet on mm -hmm. on the sun's surface, does it mean it's a beautiful day on the sun? Is it a good day on the sun? That's a good question. Oh, you know, it? I don't know if if there. I don't think anybody's living up there on the sun because it's a little too hot for that. But maybe if it were, they'd say, yeah, this is a nice to just relax and hang out. Yeah. So a weatherman would question. say that to us today <laughs> on the sun. They might. Yep. Okay. Well, let's see. Let's go back to our uh, material here, and we can revisit the. Um, backyard in a bit. So here are some more pictures from prior years um, since you know today's sun is not offering all that much excitement compared to what it could. Here are some pictures from the past where the excitement was much greater. So here is a solar prominence that is truly enormous right and spectacular looking. So here on the you know on the right look at this you know again keep in mind that the earth could shoot through this this hole here for example right so this this gap that you see here yeah pew right you know, we could shoot the earth right through there. So this is this is truly amazing. And in fact, here's a here's a cool video that shows some of this stuff in action. Right? This is one of my favorites. So this is done by uh, uh, NASA. Uh, we do have some spacecraft that uh, look at the sun all the time. So again, this is so these are not through Hubble, right? But dedicated observatories just for the sun, and they collect these kinds of images. So here you can see, you know, uh, a prominence erupting up close. So here you can see the sun and yeah now watch watch what develops here you can see something is forming so there are straw magnetic fields in play pulling hydrogen plasma you know really hot gases hot charged gases away from the sun into a really nice prominence developing in kind of a, this arc this loop and then gravity of the sun ultimately ends up pulling a lot of this material back down and you get this this rain effect. And yeah, there's the earth to scale. So yeah, the earth is nothing compared to this, this structure. I would love to be able to see something like this up close. I think it's really spectacular. Of course, this is a time lapse. So, you know, in reality, these structures last for hours or days. Um, but here, you know, this has been filmed over, you know, one of those periods and then compressed down in time. Yeah, so I really like this one. I think this is a, this is really nice. Now, um, this kind of uh, maybe Bill will talk about this a little bit more later, too, when he talks about eclipses. Usually we see these prominences only when we have these special hydrogen alpha telescopes, like what I have currently in the backyard. But the one time when you can see them without that type of special equipment is during a uh, total eclipse. So here is a case where, yeah, the moon is covering up the sun. So it's blocking out all the bright light that usually floods our atmosphere and our eyes, such that um, the prominences just pop out and become visible without any special equipment. I mean, there's still a telescope involved just to kind of make this all appear bigger. You know, uh, but yeah, you can see prominence is right here, you know, and actually here's a hydrogen plasma that's kind of got shot off into space, you know, glowing red in hydrogen alpha light. And uh, yeah, so I think this is just a spectacular picture. So eclipses are awesome because you can really see these prominences without special hydrogen alpha equipment. Uh, here, this is from 2017. This is a lucky shot that I took through my telescope just with an iPhone. I just got lucky. The moon is receding from the disk of the sun. So you can see the sun is starting to pop out here. Um, but I still managed to to capture this this prominence here without any special hydrogen alpha filtering, you know. So still we're blocking out enough of the bright light of the sun that that the uh, prominence is visible. Whereas usually the prominence is just flooded by all the other light that the sun emits, and you know they kind of disappears in the brightness. And here's a really fun historical picture of a of a solar eclipse. So this is from 1919, and there's a giant. Um, prominence here look at this thing it looks like a handle right on the sun it looks like you'd be able to grab your put your hand here and just pick the whole thing up like a kettleball maybe or something like that so this is a fun picture and this picture is actually fun for other reasons because this picture was used to 
help uh, cement Einstein's theory of relativity. So there, there's some fun science actually that goes with this picture as well. Here are just some more solar problems pictures just for fun. Look at this. This is just so cool. Right? There's a big eruption here. Here's one of those giant handles again, right? Looks like you could just pick up the sun with it. Here's another one. Wow. All right. And let's see. So we can take another quick uh, detour here to a video just to give us a sense for, for how these things develop and, and how they look when the sun is really active. Yeah, and you can see here, sometimes the sun flings this stuff off into space, right? So sometimes these structures form and then they rain back down to the sun, but sometimes they are ejected and they just go flying off into space. And if they were to hit the Earth, it could actually be a problem for us. So we have scientists monitoring space weather uh, to help predict these events and, and keep us safe in case this were to happen. Uh, but it has happened in the past and you know, we have to be prepared for when this happens again. But yeah, so the sun is a really dynamic place. You know, on the average day, we don't really think about this. We just feel, that eh, it's hot, it makes me sweaty. But there's really a lot going on up there all the time. Yeah, look at this big thing that's blown off into space here. Yeah, very cool. Okay, uh, another quick question break. Did anything pop up? Yeah, well, if oh. actually we... Do... Oh, <laughs> sorry, Nancy, you... I keep... <laughs> You, you can go ahead. You can, I, I went first the last time. You go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 after you. You know, I um, I was just a way for me to wake up myself. <laughs> oh, got you. Get myself ready. Get all the questions ready for you guys. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. After you. Oh, got you, got you. Well, um, so Marie asked another question, and I think it, mm -hmm. she was mentioning, and I'll just kind of read exactly uh, what she said um, as far as her questions. It's actually a couple of questions, but let me get to hers. Um, so she says, did you say spacecraft or observing these? She's talking about like the, the sun and, and all of that, every, the observations. And then she says, um, it's kind of in response to her earlier question and the initial answer about, um, uh, oh, excuse me, I think I see, oh, the Hubble telescope would burn if it was pointed mm -hmm. at the sun. She was just wondering why. Um, and I know that kind of from my own thing, and I can answer part of it, um, I, I know there's a, a solar, the Parker probe that they sent out there. And I, what I was um, learning about was that it's going to come within 4 million miles of the sun. So they're going to learn more about um, the magnetic field and um, um, what else, the, the uh, solar flares and winds and stuff like that. Um, so that's what I had learned kind of recently, that there's a probe that's actually headed out you know, and it's going to become or come within four miles of the sun. And so, mm -hmm. Wolf, you can please go along with. <laughs> <laughs> sure, and I yeah. can read it again right. if you want me to read okay. part of her her questions. I, I think I got it, but correct me if, if, I, if I'm off in the weeds in the second, right? And like I said, we can possibly cover this a little more during some open discussion later as well, if, if what I'm saying here is not satisfactory. But um but I don't know if, if you've ever played with uh, just just like a you know like a lens where you can where you can focus sunlight and set paper on fire. Coincidentally, actually Nancy Ananya and I were playing with that a couple of weeks ago, trying to make a video for you guys, but I didn't get a chance to fully cut that together and do a final video. But I think it would illustrate exactly what you're asking about, <laughs> is that even with a small telescope like uh, what I showed at the very beginning, right? I showed a couple of telescopes where I said, oh, you really have to put a filter on these. If you don't put a filter and you just let that telescope focus the sunlight, you can very easily set things on fire. Um, and now the Hubble telescope is a much bigger telescope with a much you know, more powerful focusing mechanism than you know, a little telescope we would have here on Earth. And so you have the Hubble telescope with this really powerful light gathering and, and focusing system, uh, coupled with very sensitive instruments that are intended for looking at the deep dark sky in Hubble, right? So if you were to point Hubble to the sun, uh, I'm pretty sure the sun would just overwhelm all the mechanisms that Hubble has and pretty much wipe it out. So instead we build spacecraft and observatories that are specifically designed for the sun. Just like the hydrogen alpha telescope I have in my backyard. It's a telescope that is just designed for looking at the sun and is actually useless for looking at the nighttime sky. It is intended for looking at this really bright, you know, powerful object. So I don't know if that helps a little bit. Um, I, I, hope, I hope that kind of puts things into context. Some. Do you think I answered the question sort of? And I think you did too. And I was going to add to that. I remember when I was learning about the Parker solar probe, um, they have mm -hmm. special heat shields 
Yes. That we're protecting yeah. it from <clears throat> protecting the instruments from the sun. Um, and so that's why it's going to enable it to get within 4 million miles of the sun and not, you know, be totally, you know, uh, correct. Yeah. Yeah. yeah good point. So they really actually, we should maybe be careful. There are really two different things going on here, right? One is just looking at the sun from here, right? With either our own eyes or a telescope on earth or the Hubble space telescope, because here we're about 93 million miles away from the sun, 93 million, right? So we're far away from the sun, but we're still close enough that the sun can do a lot of damage if we're not careful. And so that's where we have to use our special, you know, observatories to, to look at the sun safely. Somewhat separately, or, uh, but related, right? Yeah, so um, Shida was talking about a probe that we've sent towards the sun that's actually going to get really close within just a few million miles, right? And if you get that close, boy, the sun is going to feel even hotter than it does from here. So yeah, that's why it needs special shielding. And Marie, I hope that oh. answered part of I know you had the two questions about, you know, if there were probes or things out in Mm -hmm. um space and then about why it would you know damage the hubble telescope if you know so i hope that answered um your question it just clicked um, for me when you when you reminded me that looking at the sun with the naked eye could damage my mm -hmm. eyes so hubble's yeah. way up there closer so exactly, then yeah. the sun will be powerful enough to damage hubble so that kind of helped me to understand things Great, I'm glad that made sense, right? And actually, yeah, you, you even said something just now that I, that I didn't highlight, right? So at least here on Earth, we're partly protected by our own atmosphere, right? So the atmosphere helps protect us from some of the sun's radiation. I mean, there's still plenty to do damage. That's why we have to wear sunscreen and all that stuff, right? But the Hubble is out there without any protection from our atmosphere. So in that regard, it's also more exposed, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, great, good, good question. And then Wolf, we have another one from Philip. Okay. Um, uh, he asks, uh, where are we at in regards to the 11 year solar cycle of minimum oh. maximum activity? That's a good question. That's a, that's a perfect lead in, I think, to what I'm about to talk about. So I'm going to table that question because I think I'll, I'll answer it uh, as part of what I'm about to say. So yeah. thank you, though. It's a good question. OK, let me move on, because actually, I think we're running a little behind because we're doing this for the first time with the Zoom setup. So I think we're, we're learning how to time this better. So uh, my apologies for being a little off, but let's um, in fact, let me kind of skip this one because I think we've we've let's kind of go through here. We had enough questions from you guys that we didn't ask you questions. So let me just get to the solar cycle, actually. So, yeah. So perfect question a moment ago. Right. So uh, we speak of an 11 year solar cycle and uh, our own weather here on Earth goes through a cycle. If you think about it, right, we, we have a repeating winter, spring, summer, fall cycle, and it just keeps going like this, right? So we have these seasons. So in a way, the sun has its own cycle like this, its own set of seasons, except here on Earth, it's a one-year cycle. On the sun, it's uh, an 11-year cycle. Uh, and so you can kind of see in this illustration, for example, 1996 was a quiet time. You know, and in this illustration, you can see, sure, the sun is hot, it's busy, it's doing things, but, you know, the, the surface, quote-unquote surface or chromosphere here, looks relatively... Uh, uniform, right? But then as we go towards 2001, towards one of the peaks of a solar cycle, peak meaning it's very active, it's very busy, there's a lot of complex solar weather, right? You can see that the, you know, sun definitely has a lot more going on. All these bright spots here, that be more exciting, big prominences. And then that fades back to, um, you know, a quieter time in 2006. So this is like one of these 11 year cycles from the past. And here is a, here's a graph that illustrates the same kind of thing, right? So here, since we've started counting solar cycles, you know, we are counting these as 22, 23, 24. The sun's been doing this way longer than we've been counting. But, you know, uh, you know, from our perspective, you know, cycle 22 was here from, you know, roughly maybe 1987 through, I guess, 97, 98 uh, and so on. And the most recent cycle was here. So it started just before 2010. This is a solar minimum here. So that's where the sun is relatively quiet and uniform. Then there's a lot of action. It gets very busy, right? There's a lot of activity, all these complicated sunspots, big sunspots and solar uh, prominences. And then things get quiet again. And yeah, look, so 2020 is the end of this graph. So we're just, you know, on the edge here, but you can see that the graph was, was hitting the minimum here, right? So for the last couple of years or so, we've, we've been around this minimum, which is why, yeah, the sun is not offering all that many spectacular sights right now, but we'll get back to that. So, you know, there, there are some indications that the sun is coming out of this minimum and is going to start getting back to greater activity. Actually, earlier this week, we had a sunspot. It was like the first sunspot I think I've seen in over a year. Right. There might have been tiny ones that NASA managed to detect, but a sunspot you could see easily from Earth with a, with a you know, telescope like in the backyard. I think the first time there was um, 
yeah, last week compared to, I think, May of 2019. So yeah, actually two years, right? Since, since I think we've seen a sunspot like that. Uh, I've seen a sunspot like that here from Earth. So I hope that kind of answers the question we just got, right? So yeah, we are right near the minimum. We're about to come out of it, you know, we think, and things should start to get more exciting again. But what's going on with the cycle? Let's talk a little bit about, you know, what the cycle is really doing. So the sun is mostly hydrogen. We talked about that already. And specifically, it's something called hydrogen plasma. Plasma is just, it's just really hot gas in a sense, right? Where electrons and protons have kind of been separated. And so this whole thing is like a tremendous soup of charged particles, protons, positively charged little thingies, right? The electrons, which are negatively charged little thingies. So yeah, so the sun is this, this soup of this charged stuff. And uh, if you remember some of your physics from high school, or even if you don't, it's fine, right? Um, this charged soup moves through convection, boiling action, like we talked about before, right? So, you know, things are bubbling up from the radiation zone, heat's coming up, convecting up to the outer layers of the sun, right? And also because of something called differential rotation. And so let me explain what this differential rotation thing means. So here's a diagram of the sun, you know, uh, this is like the geographic north of the sun. So the sun is rotating just like the earth rotates around its axis. So does the sun. But because the sun doesn't have a rocky solid surface, there's some special stuff going on here. And it turns out that, <coughs> excuse me, if you were standing like right here near a pole, it would take you 35 days to spin all the way around, right? But if you were standing on the sun's equator, ooh, it takes a lot less, strangely, right? So it turns out you actually need only about 25 days to spin all the way around. So this is what's called differential rotation. Uh, so it's like it's like the the you know sort of sloshy you know outer layer of the sun is like moving at different speeds depending on you know where you are you know along this this uh, distance. And so, so here's kind of an illustration of this, right? So imagine we're starting at a clean point where everything, you know, we kind of have the reference point where everything is aligned. But now we said that, yeah, if you're on the equator, you're actually spinning a little faster than if you are near a pole. And so as you are near the equator, you know, things get dragged along, right? So, so this part is rotating more slowly, but near the equator, you get dragged along and things rotate more quickly. So yeah, so all this stuff is, is like, it's like twisting up, if that makes any sense. So I'd imagine that you had like a rubber band, right? Maybe hold held between your fingers and you take the middle part and you're twisting it, right? So the whole thing gets twisted up uh, like this picture is showing at the end here. And all this twisting is essentially what's creating this cycle. So as we're going through this 11 year cycle here, things are pretty well aligned, then things kind of get really messy and twisty. And then ultimately this kind of unwinds or, or kind of snaps back to where it started. And really what's going on here is all about magnetism, right? You, you've probably seen pictures like this, right? This is just a prototypical bar magnet where you have a North and a South pole. And maybe in school, you've done an experiment like this one's, right? Where you've used iron filings to visualize the magnetic field lines, you know, uh, as they connect from the South to the North pole here. Um, and, and so the sun is really all about magnetism, right? So we just said that the sun is this charged soup of, you know, uh, positive and negatively charged particles. And it turns out that moving charge creates varying magnetic fields. So again, this is, this is physics that you may or may not remember. Again, if you don't, don't worry about it. But yeah, moving charge creates varying magnetic fields. And magnetic fields can also in turn affect how charged stuff moves. So there's a lot of interaction here, right? And so it's these magnetic fields that can locally slow the convection that causes sunspots. And these magnetic fields then drive prominences, you know, solar flares where energy is ejected into space, you know, and similar structures. And, and here is an illustration of, of magnetic fields on the sun from, you know, a day in 2016. So of course we don't really see these field lines, but they were calculated based on measurements taken by our solar probes. And, uh, and yeah, so you can see this is just a giant mess, right? This looks nothing as clean as the magnetic field lines from the bar magnet or the magnetic field lines that you would see from the Earth's magnetic field, right? The Earth is pretty orderly in, in terms of our north-south magnetic fields that our compasses use, but a compass would not work on, on the sun. The sun is just a mess. You can see that there is not just a single north-south magnetic pole. It's, it's just all over the place. And this is on one particular day. Here's a different day in 2018. You can see it's a very different kind of mess, right? So the sun is very magnetically active. It's all this charged stuff moving around creating magnetic fields and then those fields in turn affect how the charged stuff moves. So it's a very complicated interplay that makes things appear a little different every day. And overall, then there is this 11-year this cycle.
And so, yeah, so we can take another moment for questions if there are any. Nope, I don't think I see anything here uh, in Zoom as far as questions go. Okay. Unless I missed anything, Nancy, but I don't see any new questions. All right, that's cool. I have I okay. have questions per se, but I have a couple of uh, comments. Yeah. Okay, hit it. Okay, so Rashi and um, see Shin Fang Shin Chin Fang brought up uh, something relating to the dark hole earlier. It says that if our sun turns into black hole into a black hole, the world will <laughs> be dark and cold, but other planet yeah. will still orbit as usual. Yeah, correct. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I had thrown out that question just as a teaser earlier, right? You know, what what if our sun were to turn into a black hole? And uh, and I, I don't know if I honestly said it last time, right? But the assumption here was what if it turned into a black hole of the exact same mass, right? So the sun has a certain mass. It's a certain amount of stuff, you know, just like your mass, maybe, you know, uh, 70 kilograms or something like that. You know, the sun has a certain amount of mass. And if we just take took that mass of the sun and converted it to a black hole, what would happen? And the answer is, yeah, not much. I mean, it would be bad because the sun would be out. It would no longer be shining. We would no longer be getting energy from the sun and it would get pretty cold and pretty bad here on Earth quite fast. But the key takeaway is we wouldn't just get sucked in. So, you know, the, just like the sun is now the center of our solar system and our planets orbit around the sun, eh, the planets would continue to orbit the black hole. You know, we wouldn't just get sucked in. So black holes don't just suck things in. They're just things of mass and, you know, things can orbit them just like, you know, we can orbit the sun. Yeah. Okay, so somewhat of a follow-up uh, comment. I'm going to uh, ask Bill to uh, to add any comment if you see fit. So it's coming from Rashi. Rashi is mm -hmm. saying that if you are close enough to be pulled in by its massive gravity, you start going through spaghettification <laughs> and you'll be elongated and stretched by the immense gravity until finally broken down to bits. Bill, oh, any yeah. comments Don't... on it? Yeah, go ahead, Wolf. No, no, I'm sorry. That's fine. You were tossing this out to Bill, right? Yeah. Hmm. Want some comment coming from Bill here? Bill, you muted. Okay, maybe. Okay, maybe we have a tech problem here. Okay, but yeah. Okay, so we'll come back to that. So go ahead. Spaghettification is a, is a fun topic, and I don't want to get into it too much here now because we're already running a little bit off. But actually, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson, of course, is a is a, an astrophysicist and a great science communicator, mm -hmm. and I know he's got YouTube clips, I think, where he talks about spaghettification. So that's a fun thing to look up for. You can probably just Google spaghettification and black holes, and you'll hit that stuff right away. And it's a fun story about what would happen if you were to fall into a black hole. So. Um, yeah, don't try it, but it's fun to think about. Very good. Okay, so. All right, cool. Next. Thanks. Let's see. So we can we can visit the the live view one more time here, and then um, actually, let's see. Maybe in the interest of time, we will uh, we will skip this guy. Okay. Yeah. So let me just do this here. So I'll tell you what. So let's close out this part of it, right? Because we think we need to transition to the part where we go through kind of the the topics for the day. Right, so uh, we will do that here. And so let's just go visit the backyard one more time. If anybody just joined us recently, make sure they get a chance to see what is happening out there. So oh, our sun has crept away a little bit. Let's, uh, let's bring it back. So again, I'm adjusting the telescope a little bit. So we're still seeing Yeah, okay, so we're still seeing those prominences. Again, they're relatively small, right? Because we're near solar minimum, so we've learned that now, right? So we know that we are at a point in the sun's solar cycle where the weather is typically very quiet. Uh, but even with this quiet weather, it's like we got these things here. And keep in mind, they're large enough to still possibly swallow the Earth. Right? So we have these prominences here. You know, nice texture within the chromosphere that we can see this orange skin pattern in the disk of the sun. So here, yeah, so here's a little bit going on. Let's see, can we make that, a, highlight that a little bit more? Mm -hmm. Actually, you can see here, you, you can see that there, there's a filament here. It, it's, it's relatively small again. I mean, large compared to the earth, small compared to the sun. But this dark region right here looks like it's a filament. So it's one of those things where just like a prominence, you know, creates a loop or an arc here. You know, here we have that sticking out from the sun and it appears dark to us from our perspective. OK, 
yeah so we have yeah there's a little bit going on still here ah kind of faint today let's see can we if we brighten this up nah hard hard to see either way Incidentally, so, you know, uh, if we were in Hoagie Park, you'd be looking through the telescopes directly in addition to perhaps seeing this kind of computer view. And it's interesting how the computer view differs from what our eyes can perceive, right? So um, if, if you're a photographer, you probably know uh, what I'm talking about, right? Because if you're taking pictures with a camera, you have to worry about, you know, getting the right exposure and blah, blah, blah. Otherwise, your pictures will look funny. They'll look wrong. But when we just look at things with our eyes, our eyes and our brains do a lot of this stuff automatically. So the same kind of thing happens when you're looking through a telescope, right? So, you know, your eyes do a lot of adjusting and processing very nicely that that uh, is much harder to do when we actually go through a camera. And so if you were to look at this live in Hoagie Park, the computer view is a great complement to what you're looking at through the telescope. But when you're looking at it with your own eyes through the telescope, you actually perceive things slightly differently and it's it's a it's a great thing to actually see this directly so i would encourage you to come join us uh, you know at a hoagie park event maybe later this year uh, some interesting chromosphere texture here so okay well let's see we'll we'll take another look at this in a little bit you know the uh, um Again, depending on what's going on on the sun, you know, things can develop quite a bit actually within two hours sometimes. So I've seen some pretty dramatic changes in these structures over the course of a couple hours because yeah, things things grow and fall back down. And also the sun is rotating just like the earth is rotating. So things are turning into view and out of view. So yeah, so we'll check back in a little bit here. Okay, but let's see. So actually we can jump to uh, Lipika's topic. So Lipika, had a fun topic that she chose for today where she wanted to talk a little bit about the Earth's weather and the solar cycle. So this ties into what we mentioned a little while ago about the 11 year cycle. And Lipika will tell you that I was all wrong, that it's actually not 11 years at all, but really something else. So. Okay, I will share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the study I will be talking about uh, shows a correlation between the solar cycles and weather on Earth. Specifically, the end of the solar cycle has a correlation with the beginning of weather on Earth called La Nina and El Nino. So what are La Nina and El Nino? They are climate patterns in the Pacific Ocean that can affect weather worldwide. So during normal conditions in the Pacific Ocean, trade winds blow from west along the equator, taking warm water from South America towards Asia. To replace this warm water, uh, cold water rises from the depths, and this process is called upwelling. So El Nino and La Nina are two opposing climate patterns that break these normal conditions. So as you can see, they're just, they're just two opposites, opposite direction weather patterns. But what's important to know is that they are very dangerous um, on Earth. They can cause flooding, hurricanes, and, and that, that can thus cause disruption in human water supply, agriculture practices, and even disrupt human health. So the better we can predict these weather, when these weather, weather patterns will happen, the more we'll be able to prepare for them. So now let's get into the actual study. Researchers at the National Center for Atmospheric Research have discovered that the end of our most recent solar cycle coincides with the uh, La Nina event. So keep in mind that many scientists in the past have noticed correlations between weather on Earth and the sun. So like Wolf talked about previously, seasons on Earth, right? That, that correlates with the sun and how we rotate around it. So it's not a new discovery. However, that being said, what is new about this study is this idea called the 22 year cycle. So commonly the sun is said to have a 11 year cycle, solar cycle, which goes through a th this thing called a solar minimum and a solar maximum in terms of the activity on the sun. So let's go in more depth about what the solar cycle is. It's the appearance and disappearance of sunspots on the sun. And they've been observed for, by humans for hundreds of years. So these appearing and disappearing sunspots have taken place in approximately 11 year cycles. But these cycles do not have distinct beginnings or endings. There's a lot of fuzziness in the length of any particular cycle. And that's why it makes it super challenging for scientists to match this 11 year cycle up with what's happening on Earth. So. In this diagram, we'll learn the difference between the 11-year cycle and 22-year cycle. 
So let's say we start with the sun facing north on the top and south on the bottom. As you can see, during the 11 year cycle, the poles switch. So now south is on top and north is on bottom. If we keep going, the 22 year cycle flips the poles again and we end up back at our original position, which is north facing up and south facing on the bottom. So yeah, just to reiterate, the sunspot happens because of pole flips. North becomes south, south becomes north, north. And this happens in an approximately 11 year period. Let's examine the difference between the solar activity cycle and the magnetic field cycle. So they are two different things. So as you can tell from the graphs, the solar cycle only takes half as long as the magnetic cycle, more elongated. So what the solar activity cycle is, is here are the maxes and here are the midpoints. The solar cycle, as you can see, it is so much more regular. You have, sometimes you have more max, you know, every, every year it changes. It makes, it, it changes per year, it changes per cycle. So it's super regular and very hard to keep, um, like a precise cycle and keep account for. So the researchers in this study used this 22 year cycle and they found it to be much more precise. It's a clock for solar activity derived from the sun's magnetic polarity. So they were focusing on when the poles flip rather than when the maxes and mins happen. Um, the 22 year cycle begins when oppositely charged magnetic bands wrap around the sun um, near the star's polar latitudes. And over the cycle, what happens is it goes, the sunspots travel near the equator um, and they travel th through the mid latitudes. And when the cycle, and the bands meet in the middle, it's called a terminator event. And that's what uh, provides guidelines for the end and beginning of cycles, essentially. But so though they're not the first scientists to discover the variability drive changes to the Earth system, they are the first to apply the 22 year cycle solar clock to the idea of weather pattern changes. So they found that this new cycle has a way better and more correlation to the La Nina and El Nino weather patterns. So I just want to do um, keep in mind before we close, like do keep in mind that the global warming and climate changes are very different uh, than the sun's actual weather. What happens on the sun definitely influences the weather on Earth, but burning fossil fuels and all the human activity we do on Earth is a totally different influence. But um, yeah, that is that is pretty much it. So thank you for listening. If you do have questions, feel free to drop it in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Ibrika. Any any quick questions for her before we move on, or you can always ask some more later if you like. Don't see any questions just yet. Oh, okay, but yeah, so I think this is pretty interesting, right? Because so one one key point here is that yeah, so what happens on the sun definitely has an impact on what happens to us here, which is why, you know, we we fund research and we fund um, uh, studies of the sun, right? Why we send probes there to look at what what's going on. So yeah, this is important stuff. Okay. Well, let's see. So I don't know. Let's see. Maybe in the interest of time, we can. Well, let's take a quick look. I guess just uh, if anybody joined us recently, I do want to make sure they get a chance to see this. So yeah. So here hasn't changed all that much. I guess since we looked last just a few minutes ago. So this is the most interesting part we have today with our, you know, prominences up here. Yeah. And also what's happening is, you know, the sun is getting lower, right? So as we're moving along the day here, the sun is, is basically setting, right? It's moving towards the horizon. And as the sun is getting lower and lower, we have to look through more and more of our atmosphere to see it. So the atmospheric disturbances and distortions actually increase. So as the day progresses, it actually becomes a little harder to get, you know, crisp images from the sun. So. That's just kind of how it goes. So, but still, I still think this is interesting, right? So even though our problems today are not that huge, I still think this is cool every time I look at it. So. All right, but let's see. So we can go ahead and pop forward. And uh, hey, Bill, do you want to talk to us about your solar eclipses? I'm very excited about this. So 2017 was the last, uh, the first solar eclipse, total eclipse that I saw. And uh, uh, yeah. All I can say is that was cool. It was actually better than I expected, right? And I can't wait for 2024. And, and Bill will tell us a little bit about the past experience about what's coming in the future. Yeah, uh, 2017 was fun. So let me uh, share my screen. Yeah. What I'm doing here. Oh, wait a minute. Host disabled participant screen sharing. So. Oh, maybe. Somebody hold on. I think you, no, I think you joined us. Well, we'll fix it here. <laughs> there you go. No problem. All right, thank you for trying it again here. Boom. 
This will stop other screen sharing. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Lipica. <laughs> that was a good presentation. Excellent. All right. So I'm looking for, hang on. Let's try this one. Hit share. All right. And I will, well, how do I do that? Interesting. Ran into this before. You know where I can turn, put the uh, the button to put all this uh, top stuff down at the bottom. Uh, there's a little, oh, here, I found it, I found it. All right. Okay, so I want to go into, start the slideshow, play, play from the start. All right. All right, we right, are there here. We all Fantastic. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I'm Bill O'Neill. I've moved from the Sunnyvale, California area up to Seattle, Washington, which is uh, good and bad news, as they say. So I have a two-year-old grandson and a daughter and son-in-law, and, and we're enjoying it up here a lot. But I do miss the uh, uh, the fun of um, you know, SJA activities and meetings and uh, our CDO and all the good stuff before with the pandemic. So I'm sure you guys are all struggling like we are up here. So uh, today we thought that we'd talk a little bit about the last solar eclipse, which was in uh, uh, 2017, August, uh, what was it? August 21st, 2017, yeah. And, and Wolf and I went up to uh, Madras, Oregon. So. Let me get this started here. Okay, let me do this. It's funny, sometimes the push buttons work and sometimes the mouse works. So uh, back in 2017, um, Google Maps and uh, a guy named Fred Espinak uh, put together a, a path of the eclipse. And you can see this one went all the way from the uh, West Coast, uh, up in Oregon, uh, down across the United States and ended up, I believe, in Georgia. So it was pretty cool. And if you could get to see one, uh, it's, it's worth, definitely worth doing. And uh, just a quick note here, you can sort of see the guy that put this one together was Javier Jubia. And uh, he and Fred Espinac do a lot of work on the eclipses. So let's just see what else we got. So if you zoomed in on their maps, uh, you can sort of see uh, this the maps show uh, the center line is of the eclipse is the red line. And then as it as you move toward the blue lines, you get less and less of the total eclipse. Eclipse. So it's really important to be on the on the center line of the of the eclipse note if you're going to go look for it. So this is 2017. Let me show you if you zoom in up to where we actually went. Uh, we went up to south of Salem, and the mecca for this thing, uh, in a lot for a lot of people, was an uh, uh, what was the name of it? Anyway, we wound up uh, going to uh, Mitchell, Oregon, which is just about fifty miles uh, east of was it Madras? I think was the was where where the uh, yeah right. It was very close to Madras. I think that's correct, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So anyway, so we found ourselves right on that line. Uh, we rented some, uh, a little place up there in the painted hills of uh, Oregon. It was great. And uh, what my, my wife did, she's into photography. And th this, uh, this software, uh, the Solar Eclipse Maestro for Mac Macintosh, was put together, together by uh, Javier Jubia. And it worked great. Uh, we'll talk more about it. But anyway, it allowed her to program her um, camera, video camera, and and almost set it up and and let the camera run automatically. So when you're interested more about that, I'll, I'll tell you separately offline. All right. So here's the family uh, photo. It's my daughter Shannon, and uh, me, and my wife Susan, and Shannon's husband Stephen. Uh, so I got to tell you about the kids. So my daughter's name was Shannon O'Neill. Uh, so when she married this tall, handsome young man, they decided to sort of keep some bit of the Irish tradition. So they called, they gave their, their maiden, the mother, um, married name is O'Bent, O apostrophe B-E-N-T, because he's Stephen Bent. And they did it for the 
driver's licenses, you know, the taxes, the marriage license, the whole nine yards. So, so every St. Patrick's Day, we we smile a lot down here in uh, in Sunnyville or in Seattle. I'm gonna lie down for a little bit. Okay, dear, you're on the air. <laughs> so, anyways, Susan Susan was explaining she's uh, gonna take a break. So. Um, so here we are in the Painted Hills of, of Oregon, and it's me and uh, Wolf and Stephen and Shannon. It was really kind of a pretty area, and it was much quieter than Madras would have been, I'm sure. All right, so here's the crew getting ready, and we're with a lot of people from uh, the East Bay uh, Astronomy Society. Uh, if you guys know Richard Ozer, he heads the uh, Golden State Star Party activities and uh, helped put together a lot of this stuff. So uh, we, we joined them up at Mitchell. <clears throat> and there's Wolf uh, with his telescopes. I don't know if you guys remember uh, Mina Reyes. Uh, she was uh, Mark Wagner's uh, ex-wife. And uh... oh, did we lose Bill? Hey guys, what happened? I think we lost uh, our connection to Bill. I think so. <laughs> oh no, okay. Um, All right, maybe he'll figure that out. Maybe his his internet will come back. You're on mute now. Can you go back on mute? Oh yeah. Now, like I said earlier, this is live TV, right? So <laughs> yeah, things can be glitchy. Sometimes Cena doesn't play along. Sometimes, you know, bits get lost. I don't think Bill realizes that uh, he's muted. Can you hear us, Bill? I do now. I do oh. now. Can okay. you hear? Yeah, all right. Yes, we lost you somehow, so uh, watch your back. Yeah, the whole thing went away, so uh, sorry about that. But anyway, I was talking about the lovely and talented Mina Reyes, who's Mark Wagner's uh, ex-wife and uh, a, a great astronomer in her own right. We've been to a lot of events with her in the past, and so she was sharing the eclipse with us. All right. It's interesting how tough it is to get everything going. So here's my dear wife, Susan, running her. Uh, um, so, so I think your your I think your share. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. What you were intending. I can hear you, but I think your video share is. Uh, we're, we're seeing your um, edit view. We're not seeing your presentation view. So you may have oh, to okay. make sure you're sharing your your you know presentation window. How presentation do I? Window. Let me, uh, okay, let me just stop the share. Yep. Okay, great. And we see you. start it again. In space, next to Jupiter and Saturn and uh, the Earth and Mars. All right, so I'm going to go to this one and share. And I'm going to ask it to. Uh, There we go. Great. We got Susan sitting at her laptop and her Nikon. Okay, you can see that picture. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can see Susan uh, sitting at the laptop. Yes. All right, let's just see if that'll advance here. All right, so this is the first contact picture, but I'm not seeing my lips moving on the screen. So I'm nervous you guys are hearing this. Don't, don't worry about your lips. Go ahead. We're good. Okay, all right. So anyway, in any eclipse, uh, obviously the moon is passing in front of the sun. And so uh, it's, it's a new moon, if you know what that means. And it just happens to line up perfectly so that the full moon uh, or the, the entire moon covers exactly the sun. Now, how they happen to be exactly the same size often as often as they do is amazing because it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty dramatic that they're even close. Okay, so the first uh, contact is C1, and uh, let me hit this again. We'll just go through a quick few of them I want to, and just sort of as the moon crosses the sun, you see less and less of it. And then there's a very bright spot called the diamond ring that just, just before it goes uh, completely total. And, oh, and there's also some Bailey beads, which just because of the, uh, the, the craters, craters on the moon that you sometimes...
Okay. Seems like Bill has glitchy internet today. But while, while we're waiting for him to unglitch, I guess, um, Bill just mentioned how, you know, it's amazing that, that the moon can cover the sun. And, and we're, we're at a lucky time in history, actually, because it wasn't always so, and it will not always be so. Okay, I'm So the moon recedes. Oh, again. hey, Bill. You're, are you back? Can you hear me? Okay, yep, you're back. Okay, let me share it again. Mm -hmm. And if this does, well, let me just finish the sentence I was saying there, right? So, so Bill was just talking about, you know, how the, how the moon covers the sun, right? And it's kind of amazing. And yeah, but it's not always been like this and it won't always be so. The moon is receding. So we live at a lucky time in history, right? If we lived, um, you know, I don't know, I, I forgot the, the time spans now, but at some point in the future, right, the, the moon will be too small from our perspective and it will never be able to cover the sun fully again. And you will never, ever again get a total solar eclipse. Um, and whereas in the past, they were actually more frequent. Okay, am I back on the air? Can you hear me? Larger. Yes. All right, ahead, so Bill. can you hear me? Are you, can you see the show? No, your share is not on. Yeah, can you, Wolf, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. I'm afraid we're going to have to pull the plug on it. It's just not working. I've, I've oh, brought in some... Glitchy. All right. You know, yep, sometimes technology, you know, technology doesn't lit. quite play along. So we will maybe try this again a little bit later. But thank you, Bill. So I think one, one key thing that we didn't get to here is, yeah, so, so, you know, 2024 is the next total eclipse. So the one in 2017 was two minutes of totality, right? So if you were near the path of totality, Bill showed that, you know, map earlier where the, the path of totality was going over the United States. Um, if you were near the center of that, you would see the sun covered by the moon for about two minutes. And that sounds like a long time, you know, and before I actually went and saw there, yeah, people said, oh, it'll go fast, it'll go fast. And this thing is like two minutes, that sounds like a long time. Cause you just, just, just imagine just sitting there looking at your watch for two minutes, it feels like forever. But when you're looking at the eclipse this way, it's like, man, it does go super fast. And so I'm excited about the 2024 eclipse because there on the path of totality, we expect about four minutes of, of total eclipse. So, wow, that's like, you know, twice as much awesomeness as we had in 2017. So if you have not seen that kind of a thing, go see it. Um, I'm hoping to be able to find some nice spot, maybe in Texas somewhere where we can see it. So that eclipse will take a different path of the United States. It'll start over Texas and kind of sweep up, you know, towards the upper East Coast. Eclipses happen all the time, really, on Earth, but oftentimes they are over the ocean or something, right, where it's hard to go. But we get lucky and that we will have another one over the U.S. very soon. So... Think about visiting the 2024 eclipse. Start planning early because lots of people will want to go there and uh, it may be difficult to find a place to stay and see if you're not prepared. So yeah, still three years away, but sometime soon, I actually need to start thinking about what to do. So, all right, thanks. Um, let me kind of pop back here and just see what we've got going on. Possibly in the backyard as kind of a final, final look. Yeah, and again, here's, you know, here is the full view of the sun, or as much as I can fit into the camera view. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know, looking pretty cool. We can see the prominence activity still here a little bit at the top, but it's becoming harder to see as the sun is setting, right? And we have to look through more and more atmosphere to get a clear view. Okay, um, any, any questions, anything you guys want to ask, uh, you know, feel free to... Um, bring that up now you know we can have a little bit of uh, open discussion and chat if you like but thank you all for you know sitting through this with us i appreciate you visiting with us today i hope you'll join us at some point in the future in hoagie park you know it is a fun experience to be able to look at the sun directly you know with your own eyes through t telescope you know in a safe fashion um and uh, you know it'll be a nice compliment to what we did here today yeah, well, I was going to say we do have a few questions um, sure, that great. came in um, on Zoom. Um, yeah. One of them was, let me get to it. Give me just a second here. Uh, one of them came from Marie. What are good years to target going north to see the Aurora Borealis? Ooh, um... That's a good question. I have not seen them myself, actually. So that's something that's on my to-do list. Um, 
So uh, I have to do research on this myself somewhat, right? So when I go, I, you know, I have a good plan. But certainly years when the sun is more active, you're more likely to, I think, see something interesting there, right? So you probably want to be more towards one of those years where you're near solar maximum, um, right? The, the aurora are a function of, you know, the solar activity, you know, how much stuff the sun is kind of sending our way and it'll do more of that stuff when when we're near solar max. Um, so that's kind of a squishy answer. Anybody else on the call who, who has had more experience here and can maybe give a better answer than I just did, including our audience? Oh, Marianne? Yeah, I went okay, up yeah. to uh, up north of Fairbanks, Alaska in 2013, which was right at the beginning of that solar max. So I would say that um, for this next cycle, 2025, 26, 27, and 28 would be optimal. Um, NOAA has a website where you can track solar activity and they have Aurora alerts. So um, we were lucky enough to, this is my plan. Um, you go during solar max, you go, if you go to Alaska, either October or March, because that has less cloud and less uh, storms. Um, you go during new moon, so you have nice dark skies. And um, what's the other? Um, you, you watch your solar forecasts and oh, go for at least uh, seven to 10 days because in October and March, you'll be guaranteed some clear nights. You won't be clouded out. So that's my best advice for going to see the Aurora Borealis in Alaska. And it was fabulous. We had some, you know, when you look at photographs, they're kind of greeny, hazy um, uh, from, by your eye, but the photographs can bring out more color. And so the first couple of nights we saw the greeny, hazy with our own eyes, our photographs came out more impressive, but then a coronal mass ejection blew off of the sun. We knew it was going to come directly to us. And so, um, about 48 hours later, we saw the most incredible Aurora Borealis, full-blown color in the sky, lights all over the place. It looked like a phoenix was rising up right above me. It was really amazing. Wow, very cool. Yeah, thank you so much for that, right? I should have taken notes just now, right? So I can plan my uh, <laughs> next trip. <laughs> but, Consult uh, me when you plan to travel. Wolf. All right, I will. Sounds good. Yeah, and, and so Marianne just mentioned the coronal mass ejection, also called a CME. Uh, that's not a term I used, I think, so far in this talk today. But we, we mentioned, you know, the prominences, you know, the magnetic activity. And I think I did mention that, you know, um, a prominence can sometimes result in a solar flare, you know, a dramatic reorganization of the... Magnetic fields can result in, like, you know, energy to be blasted off into space. And an even more powerful event is a CME. It's a coronal mass ejection where it's not just energy, but actually a whole bunch of solar particles, basically protons and things are, you know, shot off into space. And so, yeah, that's one of the most powerful solar events that we know of are these CMEs. And, and it's these particles when they interact with our atmosphere and our own magnetic field that produce the aurora. So, yeah, cool stuff. Thanks. Okay, we have some other questions? Um, yeah, we actually had um, one of them, I think Nancy had just answered. Um, okay. It was, but the, before that, we had a question from, I think a couple, well, yeah, a couple questions came from Joe. One was, of course, where are we all meeting for 2024, Texas? And then another <laughs> one, he was saying, any rough guess about resuming home park events? And then Nancy had um, answered, um, you know, uh, his question, or at least that one. Um, but yeah, so uh, that's pretty much what I saw as okay, far as good. any new questions that came in. Yeah, yeah. so I imagine actually, I, I don't know, I, I, I can't watch the chat easily while we're doing this here. So, um, but you know, we have a SJA board meeting, just the administrative stuff actually this coming weekend, I would imagine one of the topics there will be, you know, how we can possibly reopen in-person activities right now that here in California, you know, things are starting to spin back up and we wanna make sure we do this safely. Because when we look through telescopes, you know, there, there is a lot of touching involved, right? You know, you've touched the telescope, you put your eye next to the, you know, onto the eyepiece and we want to make sure that we're safe when we do that kind of stuff, which is one reason why, you know, we suspended activities along with all the general COVID stuff over the last year. So, uh, but I imagine as more people get vaccinated, right? And, and, and we, you know, things start to resume normal operation. I'm hoping that, that maybe 
I don't know, you know, August maybe or something, we can do this stuff again, but we'll see, you know, I imagine we'll talk about it in upcoming board meetings and we will certainly, you know, post events uh, online when we can schedule them. So I'm excited about it. And then I think we had another question that came in um, from Joe. The sun is about to go super or about to go Nova. <laughs> ah, good question. So uh, is our sun about to go Nova, I guess, is the question, right? Is that specifically <laughs> to our, so our like. star? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I think the, the good answer, maybe the same answer is no. Uh, so um, now our sun is about halfway through its nuclear fuel. Right? So uh, we know, you know, based on how we understand solar physics and you know other stars that we've observed out in space uh, we know that our sun is about halfway through its nuclear fuel and so by the way i think you're still seeing my telescope share so the good news is it's not that the sun is going out uh, when you're looking at the the live view from the backyard it's just that now the telescope is looking at the sun through some trees so we're, we're losing our view live view of the sun because of some trees that are in the way um and uh, you know, it's not that the sun is going out today, but it will go out in about four and a half billion years, right? So our sun will eventually run out of fuel. And when some stars do this, yeah, they go through an event called a supernova. But supernovas occur only with stars that are quite a bit more massive, quite a bit larger than our sun. So earlier we had that, that star size comparison video, right? So the bigger guys that you saw there, they will go through supernova explosions. And that is when they run out of fuel. Um, I mean, the really short answer is that, yeah, there's a, a star basically has two competing forces that, that kind of keep it a star. One, gravity is trying to pull all the material of the star together into a, into a tiny spot, just like, you know, gravity is, is pulling us towards the Earth, right? That's why we don't just float off into space. You know, gravity is trying to pull the material, the hydrogen of a star, you know, together into a, into a tiny spot. But then the nuclear reaction that happens at the star's core produces energy that kind of blows up the star. So in a way, a star is this delicate balance between gravity trying to crush it together and a nuclear furnace in the center trying to blow it up. And so it sits there in this balance. And if at some point the star runs out of fuel, then, yeah, the, the force that try, keeps it, you know, from, from collapsing goes away and the star does collapse, right? So, so these large stars that, that go through supernovas, they go through a process called core collapse where the nuclear furnace turns off and gravity sucks the whole thing together. And then essentially it bounces and it will actually then, you know, blow up into space. So it's, it's like you're taking a tennis ball and you're dropping it to the floor. It'll bounce back up, right? So the, the, the nuclear furnace turns off, all the material gets sucked to the center, but then it bounces and it will blow off into space. And that is one of the most powerful events that we know of, these supernova explosions that we have observed in the past and will observe again in the future when we look out into space. But our star, our sun is not large enough to do this. Our star is a little smaller and it will um, you know, go through a different process when it dies and it will form something called a planetary nebula, which is a very confusing name that we can explain more during a nighttime astronomy session. Um, but yeah, so our star will not explode like this, but our star will, temporarily swell to become really big as part of its kind of dying process to the point where, yeah, you know, the earth will become uninhabitable actually before our star really dies. But don't worry, we've got some time, right? So we have a few billion years to figure this out. I hope that made some sense. Any other questions or, or if it didn't make sense, speak up, you know, now's the time we can, we can address those things. Meanwhile, in my backyard, I guess the, the trees have almost completely eaten the sun, I think. Okay, well, maybe we should wrap up here. So we're a little over time. Um, you know, thank you, you know, for sticking with us today. And also thank you for trying our very first zoom session this way um you know if you have feedback for us in terms of things we did well or things we should do differently or better please give it to us because we, we we could really use it we're learning from this every time and uh you know like i said this was the first time we did this in this year we used some new technology we had a couple trip ups we'll get better for next time and we can use your help to get better still so if there are any final questions or discussions again now is the time so i'll take one more quick break in case something came up going once going twice don't see any new questions okay. or anything just nice comments that you know people are saying thank you wolf and the other presenters oh, yeah. um Thanks. so yeah and just discussion um but you know so just kind of chat discussion but yeah no new questions so okay 
Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Well, then, um, just a reminder again. So SGAA, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, all the different programs that we run. And it is a bunch when, you know, especially when we're in normal operations. So hopefully, like we said later this year, we can resume a lot of the normal activities that we have. Like, for example, I mentioned earlier, you can, uh, if, if you choose to become a club member, you know, for the price of a pizza a year, you can borrow your own H Alpha telescope, like the ones I showed earlier, right? So there's a lot of opportunity here to do fun stuff if you choose to you know, join SJ for, you know, this, this a little bit of a membership fee. But even if you choose not to, please come join us at our public events, you know, uh, public star parties at night or daytime like this stuff. And, uh, you know, be aware of our school star parties. If, if you have, you know, kids in school and you want to organize a star party for them at that school, you know, we do those kinds of things. So there's really a lot going on and astronomy has a lot of pretty sights and cool science to offer. You know, so you can check out sja.net or of course follow us uh, at meetup.com sj astronomy um, and finally i want to say like if you're interested in helping out and learning and promoting astronomy and science in general then you know please let us know we can always use your help in technical and non-technical areas and for example that's how sheena got here right so you know she joined us from you know seattle as, as someone who was just looking for astronomy stuff she and i chatted a little bit and i said hey sheena do you want to help us with this and she said yes which is great you know and so um, that's, that's how, you know, we're all volunteers. I'm not really an astronomer, right? I just do this stuff because I think it's cool and I think it's fun to share. And so if you're feeling like that as well, if, if you enjoy this stuff and if you might want to share it with others as well, please let us know. We can definitely use your help. We have lots of ideas for things to do. Um, we could make this program better with more help, you know? Uh, so that, there's, there's a lot we can do if we have help. So let us know if you want to do that. You don't have to have, uh, you know, any advanced knowledge. That's fine. We'll train you up if you're interested. So yeah, let us know. You can either send a note to asksja.net or you can send a note to me at solar at sj.net and I'd be happy to hear from you. Uh, and yeah, if, if you if you don't mind, maybe you can throw this in the chat. I'm just curious, you know, what did you find most interesting today? Was there anything that you found was surprising? Found surprising? I'm just curious, you know, what you get out of today. If there was some cool stuff and some cool nugget that you could take away that maybe you can share with someone, you know, tomorrow when you have some kind of a virtual water cooler conversation. So yeah, if you don't mind, you can throw in the chat, you know, what did you find most interesting today? Is there anything that you found surprising and any other feedback, um, you know? And let's see, we had a closing Zoom poll. Let's see, do we have time? Um, yeah, maybe we'll throw it out there just for a minute. Uh, Lipika, do you want to fire this one up? This is again, just for us to get a little bit of feedback from you along these lines so that we uh, know how we did. Do you want to give this one a, a click? Yes, it's currently in progress. Oh, is it? Okay, I'm sorry. I, oh, that's right. See, uh, yeah. for some reason, I have a couple of monitors here and, and Zoom pops up the yeah. poll on the other screen. And I have to remember to look over there to see whether it's come up. And so. mm -hmm. so sometime soon, uh, we may also have another... Uh, what we call armchair star parties. So last year we had some nighttime events, you know, where we did a similar online streaming thing like we're doing here. I'm hoping that we'll have one of these, what we call armchair star parties uh, coming up sometime soon. So look for that on Meetup and we'll probably do another solar event like this next month, you know, cross your fingers that the sun will have some spectacular prominence as real time that day. And uh, yeah, we'll see. And also uh, science talks, right? So next Saturday, there should be a uh, science talk uh, Saturday night at, uh, eight o'clock, you know, Pacific time. So uh, that's also an event that is, you know, broadcast over YouTube and available over Zoom, just like we're doing this one. So look for those, you know, if you like that stuff. Okay, how did we do on our poll? So. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so someone did mention that during the closing poll, we didn't make it multiple questions. I think it, it might have messed up for this one. But um, yeah, so maybe next time we'll oh. fix it. Okay, okay. But, yeah. All right, great. Well, thank you. Um, let's see. So yeah, that's pretty much the show for today. So thanks a lot for visiting. We appreciate your feedback. You can always send us some more of it later. And uh, yeah, if there's any final questions, comments, you know, feel free to you know speak up or throw it in the chat. Other than that, again, thanks for your time today. And uh, until next time. Thank you. It was fantastic. I appreciate it. Oh, thanks, Maria. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Hope everyone has a nice day. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>